Powered from the Serino Cigar Company studio in North Carolina and broadcasting from Euless, Texas. Welcome to Primetime Special Edition number 59. Tonight, we welcome Alec and Bradley Rubin to the Special Edition side of the house. We'll talk Alec Bradley, Lars Keaton, Industry Talk, and do a Live True segment. And as always, Special Edition is sponsored by Aganorsa Leaf. Great Leaf makes great cigars. Aganorsa Leaf stands out because of the distinctive flavor of our Corojo 99 and Criollo 98 seeds cultivated by Cuban agronomists grown in the best lands in Jalapa and Esteli, Nicaragua. When you smoke one of our JFR, JFR Lunatic, Guardian of the Farm, or Casa Fernandez cigars, you will experience the unique taste and aroma that makes Aganorsa Leaf special. Smoke one in today and enjoy the signature flavor of Aganorsa Leaf. And by Regis Cigars, the Latin name Regis denotes of a king. Regis Cigars is a regal smoking experience to enjoy the handmade king of cigars. Gaius Portinius Arbiter was a Roman writer for Emperor Nero and devoted himself to a life of pleasure. Yet far from being an ordinary, he became known as an accomplished voluptuary. Showing capacity for outrageous indulgence, he was looked upon by Nero to be the absolute authority on questions of taste, a.k.a. Arbiter Elegante, especially with the science of alchemy. In his memory, we bring to you Regis, the alchemy of cultivating and blending the finest aged tobacco to achieve the best possible taste and even burning quality and elegant aromas. Regis invites you to be El Arbiter Elegante, the judge of excellence of their beautifully handcrafted and flavorsome creations. These cigars are now available to the discerning palates of U.S. consumers nationwide. Ask your retailer for Regis Cigars and become Arbiter Elegante. And by Alec Bradley Cigars. 500 cigars are set afire in this country every minute. A staggering statistic. Wait, that's a good thing. All those folks relaxing with a fine cigar. The trouble is, a lot of those cigars aren't worth remembering. They're just plain forgettable. That's why you should pick up an Alec Bradley cigar. You'll taste that baby and say, mm -mm, I'll remember you, Alec Bradley. Learn more at alecbradley.com. And I want to mention also uh, tonight's uh, featured segment sponsored by Cubanacon Cigars. As long as there have been people, there have been stories. From the stories told in paintings on ancient caves to the family stories shared around the table. Stories that make up our history and guide our traditions. Cubanacon Cigars embraces not only tradition, but strives to tell a story in every cigar. The name Cubanacon was chosen for its vibrant history and the story behind its meaning. Cubanacon means where the fertile land is abundant and is derived from the tobacco traditions that predate Cuba itself. The story of Cubanacon is not one of the past, but one that is still being written. Try the cigars that tell the story. The Cubanacon Connecticut, Cubanacon Abano, and Cubanacon Maduro. Well, welcome everybody. This is Primetime Special Edition number 59 for this Tuesday, August 20th, 2019. It's Will Cooper. I am in the Sereno Cigar Company studios. I'm joined cross-country by my co-host, friend, and colleague, Mr. Bear Duplissy. Coop, good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening, good evening. It is so – dude, it feels like forever since I've sat across from you. It, it has been. It's, it's been – I think it's been – no, it's been about two weeks. Wow. It's depressing. <laughs> it's depressing. No, I know. Uh, just, just so we can, we'll, we'll kind of update folks as the game's going on. But uh, right now, it's Phillies three, Red Sox two. Not confident uh, that we're going to hold the lead. But you know, Charlie's back. That's what's important, Bear. Charlie is back. Yes, because all the problems can be solved by having Charlie Emanuel come back to that. that there, program. there has never been a hitting coach that has an impact on a team like it, like in the history of baseball and what we've seen in the last week. That team's completely turned around. That, that team looks like they want to play baseball. I'm, yeah, I mean, Bryce, Hop, you know, Bryce Hopper hits a walk-off in his first game back. I mean, that was, come pretty, on. That was pretty, yeah, that was yeah, pretty yeah. epic. You couldn't, well, you couldn't have written it any better, man. Look, 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 listen, here's the deal. It's, pixie, it's a little bit of pixie dust. Uh, they're inspired to have him. In the, he's not, he, no, he hasn't magically waved a wand and made these guys better headed. We'll see what happens over the next couple of weeks right now. But, uh, to, by the way, Aaron was the one who broke the news to me, and I didn't believe him that Charlie was back. So go figure that. He you, was thought, you, you, you thought he was joking around? I thought he was joking around. I, yeah, you were pretty quiet on because I tagged you on. I talked to you on the post when I when I saw that it uh, when it well, became official. And well, I was actually I was actually in a meeting for my day job, and then someone in the meeting confirmed it. So yeah, that's what happened. I was in the meeting, and then someone actually confirmed it. Like, hey, did you hear Charlie's back? I'm like, this is true then. So what's more exciting to you, the fact that Charlie's back, or when like what will you what will make you happier? The moment when you found out that Charlie was back or when the moment when they inevitably fire G Gabe Kapler, which will make you happy? Oh, no, it's Charlie back. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i the positive guy uh, because he's the greatest manager we had in the history of that franchise. Uh, beloved. Um, 
and uh, you know, I never wanted to see him go. So uh, if he can, if he can make things right, then I'll be. Don't get me. Wrong, I'll be very happy when Gabe Cap was escorted out of Philadelphia. But uh, but we'll you know we'll be uh, you know here's Bear. I'll just say one more thing before we get into our guests. There are now there are broadcasters in Philadelphia for who nine years wanted Charlie Manuel's head on a platter. Even when they won the World Series, they were trying to run him out of town. These same guys have come around saying, you know what? It's the best thing. That, they they were glad when they hired him back. The devil you know is the better than the devil you don't, man. It's yep. always the, it's always the way it is. Man, you've had a shitty run of managers though. A well, shitty run of like coaches and two like like Ben McAdoo for the Giants. You know. Yes. Yes. And and. Uh, Gabe, Kep- I don't think I really. I'm still in the camp that I don't think Gabe Kapler is as bad as you say he is. Oh my goodness! Uh, but hey, listen, if you want to swap my year with Bobby Valentine for for a Gabe Kapler year, I'll I'll take him, man. And you done, can have done. you can have uh, Bobby uh, uh, Veer. Done, done. That guy's a uh, cancer. No, I don't think so compared to what we had. Oh gosh. Yeah. See, the problem. The if you want to compare, if you want to compare them. Bobby V was a cancer. Gabe Kepler is just a moron. You can fix stupid on occasion. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You, it's harder to cure cancer, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, so let's, uh, let's without further ado, because we got a great show tonight. Um, I want to welcome back to primetime uh, two great guys. Uh, really glad to have them this time uh, doing the Tuesday show. We have Bradley and Alec Rubin. Wow. wow. No one ever says Bradley's name first. Oh, no. no one ever says Bradley's name. That was amazing. Bradley will forever love you. Yeah. That's the first time his name has ever been said. <laughs> I figured I was, I was going to pull it up. I want to welcome you both back to primetime. Alec, I mean, no, I hope you're not offended. I think you, get, I think you get first. I think you get first billing quite a bit. <laughs> well, yeah, too much. Too much. That was weird. Yeah, so totally Brad, Bradley's actually catching double props tonight because Alec hasn't accepted my friend request on Facebook. So I I was able to tag Bradley, but I wasn't able to tag Alec. So there, I don't have a Facebook. Alec has no oh. Facebook. Oh man! Good for you. Who the heck? Who the, the heck, wrong who, Alec Rubin. Who the heck am I trying to friend request? <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, I, I, you know, I I did get friends with Lars Teton, so I was really glad on that. On which one of his seven Facebooks did you become friends with? Oh, him? I don't know. I didn't know it was seven. I thought I was on the Lars Heaton's one. I don't. There's a, there's a lot of them. If, uh, if you're seeing a lot of posts of, of bacon, then I'm sure you're on the right one. <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen something with that. Yeah. No, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, but it's great. But uh, hey, guys, welcome back. Uh, great, Try great to have you guys. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, yeah. Go, great to have you guys back. So, um, you know, we uh, I know we got you got we had a like, last time I did the show with you guys. I was telling you before the show. I was in London. I couldn't smoke, um, and now I'm pretty pumped, and I want to smoke as much as possible. So I lit up the gatekeeper uh, in the 60 size awesome. tonight. So uh, I haven't smoked this size yet, so I'm looking forward to it. Hashtag Have you had the three? What was that? Have you had the other three sizes? I've had um, – I think the Corona is the one I haven't had either. The Corona yeah. size. I, Corona Gordo I haven't had either. Missing out. No, I will be – yep, I have that as well. And then I have a blind face, and of course I have Lars. Um, of course. Yep. Good. All right. Well, and we're it, excited uh, to be back again. Thanks for having us. No, no problem at all. Bear, um, actually, what we, uh, just real quick, let's just go around what we're smoking tonight um, before we start. Well, hashtag our Gord- Gordos are Vitolas too, Coop. So I'm, I, in, in your honor, I thought I was paying proper respect. I thought you'd be lighting up a Corona or a Lancero, you know. For me, but I can see how much I'm making up for, for the amount of fine. tobacco I didn't get to smoke last time when I was on the show. But I had them on the show, so I'm actually smoking a Gordo too, just for you, Coop, just for you. Yep. And uh, I am um, I am smoking the Blind Faith. This is my first Blind Faith, and so I'm really excited. Uh, I've already a few puffs into it. Got some great initial flavor. I'm I'm excited to and share this with uh with Bradley and Alec tonight. We're gonna keep up the trend, Bradley oh, and Alec. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna start this thing. So, we're going to start um, this thing and then yeah. Yeah, we'll start here and end here. I'll tell no. you that right now. <laughs> now, are you guys, you guys are smoking, I, I see. Of course. Bradley's got an a older Max Ego. Probably got six years of age on that thing. Oh. It's a 52 by nine and a quarter. And I'm smoking a Gatekeeper Corona, which I'm pretty much halfway down for now. I have a couple other things lined up. I got that's uh that's my cigar that's on deck, man. I got I got a nice. gatekeeper Corona, and then I've got a I've got a Lars Teton SS. Oh, <laughs> that's the one, man. Do that next. Have you tried that, Bear? 
I'm scared to now, guys. Like that's way <laughs> too much. It's way too much excitement. Yeah, like, no, yeah, smoke, with, smoke with caution, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah that don't. I, that's why it's good you don't smoke that one first. On okay. deck for me, I got an old select ca uh, cabinet reserve that we don't make anymore as well. Yes, so I have a story about that cigar. Bradley's heard it. I, I have. Heard if you it. remember at the party, yes, yes, this absolutely. is a great I one. Not a lot at the party, but I remember that at the party. So you guys are are ready. Yeah. I'm sorry. What was that? Got Barry? Were you going to share that when he's ready? Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a... oh, so you guys are at uh, the Alec Bradley headquarters. Are you in the law offices tonight? Yes. yes. We're in the law offices. The okay. There's a Ruben Ruben and Lipset. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So yeah, your dad was telling, we had your dad on a few weeks ago. He was telling us the story. He put you guys into the office there and you guys came up yep. with a very, not the law office, you have to say. Yeah. So now, now I share an office with Jonathan Lipson, and Alex's office is right next to us, and then has a, a little door hole uh, with like no actual door, so we can all yell at each other and be on phones at the same time and not be able to ha hear our conversations. So especially because because Jonathan Lipson well. always puts it on speaker, so we can never hear our own phone conversations. Yeah. He's watching right now. That's why I said that. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I see him out there. So, so guys, um, before we kind of get into, you know, your decision to get into the family business, um, you, where did you guys go to school and what were you guys studying in school originally um, before you kind of thought about getting into the family business? So I started off at uh, University of Central Florida for two years studying business. And then I transferred down to uh, Florida International University down in Miami and ended up graduating with a degree in sociology. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. and Pretty, pretty similar, actually, uh, UCF, but stayed there for all four years and graduated with a degree in business management and entrepreneurship. So uh, pretty, uh, pretty similar track. Yeah, but I remember we were talking last time because uh, you did mention that because my son went to Full Sail. Yeah, right down yeah. the street. Yeah, yeah. But, and that's where he partied all the time was at UCF, he told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah. Drinks are, the drinks are quite cheap yeah. out there, so it's yeah. always fun. Yeah. So there was, I mean, did you know when you were in school that, Hey, you were going to go back and join the family business or was it after, after school when you said you were going to go join the family business? Uh, so for me, I think it was probably, it probably was about senior year that I realized that this was what I wanted to do. Um, I took that time to see if there was anything else. And, uh, but all throughout my four years of college, uh, I smoked cigars and got all my buddies into smoking cigars. And it was just kind of became a little culture between me and my friends and uh, kind of just, it, I decided none of my family realized that this was what I wanted to do. And when I graduated, they're like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm clearly like, obviously going to work at Alec Bradley. Like I thought that was pretty obvious. And they're like, no, no, we thought you were probably going to go do something else. Um, so, well, that, that's because you never voiced it. You yeah, never voiced the I fact just, that you wanted to come into the business. Yeah. I just figured that it was pretty obvious and, and they didn't, uh, apparently realize. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it probably wasn't until about senior year, but, uh, you kind of realize, uh, how great the industry is and, and what it's done for me and my family. So, uh, you know, what I could possibly do in the future is, you know, that was really what, what made me want to be a part of that Bradley. Since you said it wasn't like uh, something that you like verbally said out loud, what was that moment for you, Bradley, that we were like, yeah, this, this, this is it for me. This is what I'm going to do. Was there an it moment? Uh, I wouldn't say that there was an it moment, but by the, you know, the beginning of my senior year when I was like, okay, now, you know, I'm about to be graduating soon. It's time to figure this all out. And I just kind of reflected on uh, the, my years past in college. And I was like, this is kind of the, Did they freeze? Uh, yeah. They may have froze. They were having an internet issue earlier on right now. So we'll, uh, we'll give them a couple of minutes. I, I know the internet was not cooperating with them earlier on um, as, as we speak. So a follow-up uh, question I'm going to ask for Alec when he gets back is that is sociology coop is something, a subject that's always kind of fascinated me because it's, you know, it's, it's the very general study of human interaction. You know, psychology is very much more personal a little bit. Right. But sociology is very, you know, is a little bit more general. And I want to say, yeah, I want to, isn't socio psychology is like inside the mind and sociology is how the mind kind of acts. Does that make sense? Yeah. And like, and, and it's more like group, group associated. It's more the groups of people, right. you know, 
right kind of kind of like uh, uh anthropology as well it kind of sociology anthropology kind of somewhat go hand in hand typically um so that'll be an interesting uh follow-up uh for alec that i had for him so the uh you know it's 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 kind of interesting that you know like we hear about we hear so many so many sons that have sons and daughters have gotten into this business and they talk about how for a long time they fought it and they it really wasn't what they necessarily wanted up front or even the beginning but you know it was it was so ingrained in bradley for example that he just he just assumed everybody knew that that's what he wanted and that's what he was going to do and everything so that was that was kind of a, that's kind of an interesting uh difference than you see um in you know from from other from other stories and from other scenarios no yeah no to- totally you get that too uh as well you know um where uh that that's kind of a you know it's kind of i guess weird I, you know not weird but i lost my train of thought when, when you know i guess it's funny how everyone just assumed he was going to go do his own thing and then you know hey i wanted i really want to join the family business yeah i like i said i think that that's gonna that's um that's a little bit different than a lot of other tracks that a lot of other folks have taken like it's not that i think a lot of uh yeah of the, by the way the, John, yeah, yeah there's still technical issues it looks like it's not that a lot of the kids have like, you know, hated the family business. I haven't heard that one where like they, they hated it and have turned around. I think it's that they wanted to do something on their own. And, you know, it just, it, it was just a calling, man. It just kept calling back to some of these other folks and everything. So um, that's interesting. That's a, uh, that's a really interesting path that, uh, that Bradley's taken. Yeah. The, uh, how's your cigar? It's really good. Um, it's really good. Um, you get some really rich flavors off this Gordo is what I'll say. Um, it's probably a little more dialed back than the other sizes I've had, but still very, very tasty right now. Um, and I'll stand by, this is not, um, this is not, it smokes different than an Ernesto, uh, Perez Curio Jr. Cigar, which is the factory that they're working with and it smokes different than an Alec Bradley. I mean, it's, I'll stay by that as well. That was something that that was kind of the consensus when we had all smoked that blend. You know, I don't, I, I haven't smoked the Gordo yet uh, in the Gatekeeper. Um, just got my, uh, just just got a, my first one. Uh, but I have smoked about three of the Coronas, and I'm going to be smoking my fourth one tonight. Um, just a really fantastic blend. So, yeah. yeah, I just heard from Jonathan Lipson, who's the, he's the uh, director of marketing for Alec Bradley. Uh, he's trying to find out what's going on there. So just for folks who are tuning in, we did lose Alec and Bradley. They were having some technical difficulties in the office prior to the show. So uh, please stand by and we uh, appreciate folks' patience here as, um, as things go on here. So uh, we will uh, adjust and adapt uh, as, as need be. Um, and then the score is still the same of the game right now. But uh, but this is your first time smoking blind face, right? Uh huh. So let me ask you a question. Um, did it? How did? What was your initial reaction to that cigar when you kind of started puffing on it? Um, I was really impressed with the um, the spice um, and the, pe- the 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 how pepper forward it kind of was, but not like overly aggressive. Like it wasn't like overly so. It was just one of it was, uh, but it was something that caught my attention, like. When sometimes with cigars that even that are that are peppery and spicy or can be pe- even pepper bombs, they take a second to warm up. But there's some cigars that are really really great that like from the first light they 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 capture your attention. Uh, similarly to the way that I think that they like Espinosa Habano, for example, that I, you know I'm a fan of. Uh, the way that you light that up and that that kind of that spice hits you, which is really interesting. So um, I mean, if I had to if I had to guess, there's and here's here's the honest to god truth about this group i don't know anything about this blend um and but if i had to guess i'd probably guess that there's probably some corojo in it uh because of that that pronounced pepperness to it there's a really nice the wrappers really kind of got some nice leather earthy rich tones to it um um but um, it it definitely doesn't smoke like uh, it definitely doesn't really smoke like any. I mean, it has some similar similar characteristics of other Alec Bradley cigars, uh, but it has a it has a unique spin on it. If that makes sense, is it? Do you think it's a stronger cigar than you've had out of Alec Bradley? It's kind of hard to tell in a Gordo. Uh, yeah, that's true. But if I. 
the uh the the uh the petite uh, lancero coil is is got some got a lot of spice i wouldn't say strength but it's got a lot of spice it's got a lot of pepper to it and spice the um tempest has some flair the black market has some flair um yeah i mean i would put it up there for sure uh, i think i told this story when they were on the last time and I think I told Alan Rubin this story too. Uh, when that cigar came out last year, uh, Alec Bradley was sending out some pre-releases to some of the retailers. Uh, and I happened to be with Craig Cass, and he said, hey, give this cigar a try. And it was the blind face. It didn't even have the final packaging on it yet, right? Um, it, it didn't have a generic band, but it had like a prototype band. It didn't have that final band on it, but it wasn't like a typewritten band either. And I, and I lit this thing up, and I'm like, it it was like strong. I mean, it was, but this was a robusto size. I mean, it was kick ass strong, right? Right. Like, what the heck, right? So it was it was too it was way too strong. I took it home and then I went back and smoked it again. I I still thought it was a stronger blend, a little more pepper forward as far as that blend goes. But uh, I was like, and we'll get into it. It was a very different Alec Bradley, uh, even though that that was coming out of um, racist uh cabanas which is the factory they work with i was very impressed with that cigar like i said i i absolutely know nothing about this blend so when the when the when the boys are able to rejoin us i kind of want to see if i i get any of my guesses right because i honestly don't know anything about it for sure so pro it just for folks who are tuned in um the internet up their back they were having internet problems <laughs> yeah i just had to go to my phone so there we go. You guys are just, you guys really, uh, yeah, we're a mess. <laughs> I've been told that we're going to say ingenious, man. Cause pulling out all the stops. Oh, God. One sec. Take your time there. We're talking with Alec and Bradley Rubin. We were having some technical difficulties from the, uh, the law offices down there. Um, but we, they have gone to a plan B, which we are greatly appreciative to right now. So please stand by uh, our audience right now. Yep, and uh, and Alan, Dad has said they may have lost power as well, but it looks like they have light on in there. This happens, guys. It's technology, and uh, there's nothing that we could do sometimes. Or you know, when the power goes out or the internet goes out, you got to check on. the you got to check the score, Coop. You're happy. It's fine. I don't know, but it must be something. They may have a little bit of that Terrence Riley jinx going, because remember when I was in England, I was having that's when I had the connection issues. I couldn't get. There was no internet. There was no internet. He's a, and I'm calling Aaron in a panic from from England. I'm like, Aaron, we got these guys coming on field. I don't know if I could do the show. Well, we're back. Uh, we switch offices. Yeah, so we're we're good now. We're All back. right. Okay. So you're out of the law offices right now. I appreciate it. We're showing the law office, but just a, a different one of the law offices. Yep. Okay. So we we were in a I, we were in a we were talking about some of the getting into the business, right, Bear? Yeah, so Bradley was just finishing up his thoughts on like when he he didn't really have an it moment, but it was like going into senior year and he was he was uh, getting ready to get started and everything. The uh, the follow up that I wanted to ask uh, you, Alec, was sociology is a subject that's always fascinated me uh, Mm because you know study of you know it's a lot more interpersonal than obviously psychology is very personal. It's always it's about the mind, but sociology is it's a study of people people, essentially. Yeah. So uh, I mean that that has to that has to work really well, you know, from an academic standpoint, but even in practicum for, you know, with, with this business, I mean, cause you're dealing with all different kinds of people, multiple cultures. I mean, it had, it's, it's had to serve you well, hasn't it? Absolutely. I took a lot of interesting classes that actually really helped me um, now in this business, such as, you know, economic geography and, you know, learning about colonialism and all that kind of stuff really has helped me a lot in this business and understanding how people work and it's it's definitely been something that i've been able to use throughout the years which has been nice great question yeah very nice question and another question i had for you guys is we could probably be here all night literally if we were to sit here and you were to list all the things that your father alan rubin has taught you guys about this business about life it could be it could be endless but the question i was interested in asking was in the short time that you both have been in the business, what is one thing that you've taught him? Oh, wow. How to be funny. 
that's for sure. <laughs> Everything that he's learned in terms of his comedy comes from his, his son. Wow. Alec. <laughs> so I know he's listening to that one. Wow. You. There you go. You know, it, I, it's interesting because, you know, I've t- I talked about this with your dad. There's, there's like, and we were down in the office last year, so Aaron and I, I mean, there's a vibe in your office. There's a chemistry in your office. You guys have fun in that office, it seems like. I mean, we were having a ball, ball there. So I always thought, you know, it was just very natural. And I was telling your dad, I like how you guys have been doing the videos in the office right now because people are seeing what Aaron and I saw when we were down there back in November. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's just part of the Alex Bradley culture yeah. and family is – is we're all very serious about what we do here and we all have uh, an important part to play. But if we can have fun while doing it, that makes it even better. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we want to get down to business and we want to have a good time doing it. And the funny thing to me is a lot of people that I meet tend to think that we're a very corporate company, but you saw firsthand when you were down here, that is not the case. And when people say that we're corporate, it kind of makes us laugh a little bit because we, that is not us. You know, and, and that was, I'll be honest, that was what I, I mean, I, we had interviewed you guys on the show, so we had a little bit of a preview, but I remember your dad, he was coming in the office later on, I was like, okay, it's going to get very corporate, probably, it's going to get very serious, and it didn't, it was just as loose and flowing uh, the rest of the day, and then obviously, if you folks saw the, saw the show with your dad back a few weeks ago, yeah. uh, and I was, and you've heard, I was pretty nervous, because I said, if one thing goes wrong, he's got to be really pissed at me, right? <laughs> So I'm like, so I was the most wound. I was the most wound up there. I have, I was more wound up than in the DR that night. Uh, oh man, that's yeah, intense. It, yeah. So I can't, I can't imagine why. <laughs> well, because again, technical difficulties. But the technical difficulties, you know, you 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 just don't, you know, you don't want to have them. Um, yeah. So yeah. So uh, it happens though sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, it's good here. So. We were just kind of talking before um, before you guys lost the power, and we were just talking about Blind Faith there. Um, so Blind Faith was your first project, right? Yes. Who who which of the, which of you two came to the other brother and said, "Hey, let's do a cigar"? Was it? What did you buy? Was it both like an aha moment? You had it, or did one go to the other brother and say, "Hey, let's let's do this right now"? Actually, uh, Bradley came to me, and I had already been in the business for well full time for over three years at that point and Bradley came to me and said hey I think we should come out with our own cigar and I kind of uh chuckled and said okay let's let's talk about that and everything after that got kind of got pretty interesting pretty quickly but obviously we moved forward with the idea and are extremely happy that we did right um and when I know when we had you also on the show and talked to your dad last time this was, hey, you guys aren't just going to put your name on a cigar here. Uh, you guys are going to have a, a, a role in the development of this, um, the branding, the blend, and the brand, the stake in the brand. Yeah, I mean, we don't plan on, on going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, so so as, as long as we can start early and learn as much as we can from the beginning, uh, it's really only going to help us in the long run. So. Uh, that was really the, the whole idea is, you know, coming into the business, uh, finally get to work with my brother and my dad. And this is where we want to be uh, for the forever. You know, we, we want to be at Alec Bradley and have Alec Bradley uh, for as long as we can. And uh, that was really the whole, the whole part was my dad said, you guys can either be on Roop and Sons or you can be Alec and Bradley. And, that's that was really the first step in being Alec and Bradley is, is making our own cigar and, and kind of creating our own path. Did you? Uh, go, did, I know your dad also said as far as the brand goes, you guys have a stake in that brand too. Yes, we are. Yeah, yeah we both uh, invested into it. That's why it was such a limited production up front. We could only afford so much, and we were only allocated so many pairs of rollers. So right. Yeah. So you know, for this first project, you you went with the factory that really uh, has been synonymous with Alec Bradley uh, over the years. It's the racist Cubanas factory. Yeah. Um, what was like the first step? Did you guys go down there and start uh, kind of just, did you, what was that first step when you took, when you decided you were going to work with that factory? Well, we had already been down there before and we'd already been playing with blending and all that stuff. But 
we went back down once we decided it was that we wanted to do the project. And that's when we really seriously got fully into blending and trying to figure this out. And I think we went through from start to finish either 30 plus different or also iterations of blends until we got to the final blend. And I think it took us a, a full year from the time we said, okay, let's go to the time that we released the product. And that's, that's, uh, that is a fairly long time, a full year to release one product, but it was our first one and we wanted to make sure it was everything it needed to be before it released. And just to add to that, uh, you said that Bryce Cabanas is pretty much synonymous with Alec Bradley. So uh, doing the first cigar with them blind feet was because they are synonymous with us. Uh, they are like family to us. They produce most cigars that are known uh, to Alec Bradley smokers. Most cigars that we've gotten rated by cigar aficionados, so Pensado and Tempest and Coyol and Family Blend. Um, Sanctum, all cigars that have come out of Rice and Cabana. So to do something with them is because of what they've done for us as well was was really uh, an important factor. And that's not at all to discount the other the other factories that we work with because we're currently working on projects now with uh, the Placencia family, which is hopefully hopefully will will be able to release soon. Oh wow! Wonderful. Fantastic. But you, you you guys have worked already with uh, I know you guys have done some stuff with Placenti in the past, meaning Alec Bradley has, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Alec Bradley has done a ton with both Placentia and with uh, Rice is Good So right, but we're we're obvious, and then with Gatekeeper, obviously, we decided to go in a little bit different direction with that factory, but that was a very fun experience as well. Yeah, sure. Now with Blind Face, uh. When I remember when the, I was telling a little story when, uh, about when I, I think I told you guys when I first smoked it, it was very, very strong, right? Yeah. Craig Cass had given me a sample. I remember when I got like the press information on that cigar and I'm looking at it and I, it had the, uh, the atrocious, uh, the atrocious bind, uh, atrocious. Oh, don't ruin it, man. I was going to guess. Okay. I'll let you guess. Go ahead. So when, when you guys were having technical difficulties, we were, I, he was asking me about my opinion about the cigar. I'm about a couple inches into it now and really enjoying it. And what I was saying that there was some initial spice pepper, like right off the, right off the light, you know, it's even like pepper bombs. Sometimes this isn't a pepper bomb, but even pepper bombs sometimes have a t tendency to take time to warm up a little bit and get that. There was an immediate flavor right off the light and everything. And it, and so the, the, my hunch is, because I, I really don't know anything about this blend, my hunch is that there's probably some Corojo in here um, because it, it's got a really nice, really nice pepper aroma. And then there's some really nice coffee uh, retrohale, which I get off a lot off Corojo. Um, and uh, um, there's a really nice, like overall from the, like the wrapper, there's a really nice earthy and leathery texture to it and flavor. So I probably would guess that there's, there, it's, well, I think, I think he ruined it, but I, I, I was going to guess a hunter and rapper of some sort. So I right or wrong on any of that. I'm probably going to really embarrass myself. <laughs> no, you're actually absolutely correct. There is a, um, yeah, you're pretty spot on. There's Corojo and Criollo, both in the blind. It's a uh, Trojas wrapper from Honduras. It's a Honduran Nicaraguan binder and then all Nicaragua, three different Nicaraguan fillers. You know, and I remember when I looked at that blend, right? Alec Bradley, what I, the Trois wrapper and the double binder, they're like signatures of many of your cigars. And I think I was talking with you that particular, that wrapper. You guys have done with that wrapper what no one else has done. Um, but what I was surprised about is the, the blend that you guys came out of was something we hadn't seen anything from Alec Bradley like before. This was a bolder blend. It, it just, it, and I thought it was, a, like I said, it was very strong when I smoked it. But like a few weeks later when I smoked it again, it, it had a boldness. And it was really, it really kind of like, wow, this thing, this cigar made a statement that I hadn't seen before. And it was showing an influence on another side of Alec Bradley we hadn't seen before. Hey, you guys can really put out a nice, bold cigar. The, the difference uh, with this cigar versus maybe the Alec Bradley's is we really concentrated, obviously, on the wrapper binder. But on the filler, we did something a little bit different. And there is Lijero and Maduro in that filler that you think would really make this thing extremely robust, but it just mellows it out very nicely, actually. And it, that's what I think that's the flavor that you're kind of that you're probably getting from that cigar. Yeah, it was. Um, 
And, you know, the reaction that you guys got from that cigar, you had to be very pleased. Um, you had to be very pleased with that. People could have scoffed at our first cigar that we came out with. And maybe some people did. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But a lot of people were really pleased with what we did. And we're, I mean, we're extremely happy with what we did, but we're always looking to get better. So, I mean, for, 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 like I said, a rookie effort, so to speak, uh, that was a, like I said, a very, very good cigar. Um, and I know we talked a lot about the packaging of that cigar too. You guys came up with the whole, just about the whole concept with that, which was really uh, a great thing. Yeah. I mean, I gotta give props to Bradley. On that I mean, one. yeah. I mean, first of all, back just to the blend, we have a lot of great people that, uh, you know, help and uh, have been teaching us, obviously my father and our vice president, Ralph Montero, and then people down at the factory. So um, we have a lot of, a lot of really helpful and, and people that are been doing this for a long time there to teach us. So we're, we're very lucky to have them. Um, and then in terms of the packaging and, and the retroness and blind faith, which, you know, obviously I got a lot of the, the band, the blind faith and Eric Clapton references and all that stuff, which was a whole lot of fun. Uh, I really just wanted to do something that was fun. Uh, I think that's something that sometimes gets missing in cigars sometimes. Uh, so to see something that maybe reminds you of, uh, you know, your childhood or some sort of nostalgic, uh, you know, memory, whatever it may be. Uh, that was really the the mindset behind the, the whole old TV and the SMPTE color bars and the test check in the background because that's what I remember in the 90s was those things growing up. Um, so I wanted to add something from from our past, like, you know, while we were growing up into our first project. And your dad told me the brown tie was his idea. Yes, the brown tie was the most stressful part of all the packaging. Uh, that, a blue tie and a brown tie and uh, he for whatever reason I don't know it's such a small little detail um, and I was getting I was getting on a plane I think I was texting Alec and my dad and they're like we need to know right now like brown tie or, or blue tie and I was just like just do the, the brown tie because that's how we usually dress so right. uh, it's that that ties it that tie decision took three weeks I'm not joking Really? Yeah. Oh, it's very unnecessary. Yeah. <laughs> I liked it. Uh, like I said, when when I was growing up uh, and I was wearing ties out of like my first job in college, uh, Reagan was president and he made the brown. He brought the brown tie. He, he brought the brown tie back into style in yeah. the late '80s. So it was guys. Kind of, and I'll be honest, I didn't notice it on the package until your dad pointed it out when he was on the show. Yeah, that's the thing. We know no one would notice except for us. But it's just those, that's how my dad is, our dad is wired and how we're wired is the, you know, does the flow of the, of the art, you know, does it take you to the right place and do you notice everything? And, you know, ultimately no one could have noticed these small little details, but it drives us crazy. We scrapped entire projects because the artwork did not feel right. Wow. More times than I care to admit. And a lot of times we hear, you know, that sometimes we, we how many brands you hear because of the artwork that it, that sometimes they'll say if the artwork doesn't fly, they'll say that's why the cigar didn't sell. And then they go back and scrap it and do it again. And, and then people I say, think oh, there are many, many cigars that have been in the marketplace that may not have been visually appealing, but the cigar was absolutely, absolutely kick ass. Yep. And it went away because of that. And that, that, that's hard. That's the hard part. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah, Alan's very, in the chat right now, and he's saying, "If you we love the idea, it was all him, and if we hated it, it was all you guys." Yeah. So. <laughs> Sounds about right. Playing the blame game. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of like the Phillies. You know, if it's going good, it's Charlie Manuel's fault. If it's bad, it's Gabe Kapler's fault. Right. <laughs> all right. Oh, <laughs> all right. So, um, Bear, anything on the blind, blind faith you want to hit too? I'm just really enjoying this cigar and I, I, I couldn't agree more than, than your assessment on it, Coop. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, the, I, I did, I have had the gatekeeper and I know we're going to get into that. So I don't want to spoil my thoughts on that, but, uh, but this is, uh, this is my first blind faith and I'm, I am enjoying it exceptionally. Uh, I'm not just saying that because of the company that we're keeping at the moment. Yeah, I'm really, really enjoying it. I think it's a really well put together blend, really well balanced, 
um, and just, just, and it's a Gordo to boot, and I'm, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. So. Gordo's a Vitola's too. I told you that all along. <laughs> you know, it's, while Blind Face came out, I mean, I thought 2018 was a big year for you guys. The other cigar that came out le- at the show last year with the Blind Face was Magic Toast, which mm-hmm. I think was like one of the revelations of the show. It was a huge hit for you guys. Um, did you guys have any input into that project? Uh, I did not. I personally had very little. Okay, because so. that it's that also seemed like a very different type of Alec Bradley blend than we had seen in the past. Yeah. Not to say that you guys always made the same cigars, but again, I didn't expect a like that was a Maduro, and I just didn't expect that type of Maduro. Um, it wasn't it wasn't like any other Maduro I had in the market, and that just was. I mean, the success that you guys had with that cigar, you you have to be really pleased with that. Yeah, I mean. You're, you you hit the nail on the head with that. Uh, it is like completely different. Uh, and I think that's something that we're going to try to continue to do is to make things interesting and put out, you know, different cigars with funky artwork. And uh, it's, you know, I think Alec Bradley's headed in a really good direction right now. And my dad and all at the, uh, at the range right now, just leading the company. So uh, him and Ralph did amazing with Magic Toast. It's doing unbelievable for us right now. So we, we really couldn't be more proud of it. Yeah, think, and, and, yeah, go ahead. I think our only input was we were actually down at the factories and we smoked that blend, um, not knowing what, not having a project behind it. And both Brad and I both said, that's a good blend. And that was about the extent of our input. <laughs> but what, what, what was really, what I thought was really important with these two cigars is there's a lot of great and unique cigars that you guys have in the portfolio. Coil, I mean, just a great example of a, of a cigar. Um, that was part that, of that one. Yeah. Best cigar ever. Oh, it's amazing. So Matt Booth got me hooked on that cigar. I think I was telling you. Uh, in a Lancero bear, by the way. Yes. Yeah. No, that, that, that's the very best size in that blend. It, hands it, down. It, yeah. And it, it was just like that cigar was just um, – and, and I loved the wrap box packaging on that cigar because to me, I just love packaging like that. But that cigar was just uh, – for, for a vintage, single farm vintage cigar, great, great cigar. I mean, just – and, and I, what I liked about it is these cigars that you came out, the new ones, I think were a great gateway, not to steal the word ahead, <laughs> to kind of rediscover some of these great cigars. Hey, retailers maybe got away from Alec Bradley or something. Hey, you got these great cigars, but hey, we got all these other cigars too. And it was a great way to reintroduce some of those cigars to some people maybe who had not been introduced to them before. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that was part of all the fun uh, when I finally got working for Alec Bradley and getting to do blind faith and now gatekeeper uh was to bring some of my own ideas to the table and you know people seem to really be accepting uh of what i what i had to say and uh i i really think that where we're headed right now is is very very good for for the entire company yep so let's talk about gatekeeper we've been kind of alluding to it uh give us the that this was kind of going to be project two um, we, I think we had all sense that, you know, you, you guys were going to do some more work. Uh, you caught us all by surprise when this, when this project came about, we didn't expect, uh, a cigar. We didn't expect this cigar. We didn't expect where it was coming from or the project. So take us a little through the timeline of how this started. Go for it, Brett. Yeah. So, um, it all kind of started, uh, around Cigar Fest. Uh, Ernesto happened to be in our booth, uh, talking with my dad and, after they were done, it looked like they were talking about something important, so I definitely did not want to interrupt. And uh, and I was like, "Dad, you're friends with Ernesto," and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, we you know we go way back and this and that and blah blah." blah. And I was like, "I I love his cigars." When once I got into the business and started smoking everyone else's stuff, uh, a couple of his blends just wowed me. Uh, the main two being the Dusk and the La Astoria. Um, so I just kind of fell in love with, with the EPC line. And I know that's not the story for most people. Usually they got started with uh, the La Gloria line. Um, but for me, it was EPC. And uh, and after that, I, I asked my dad, I was like, do you think you'd be interested in, in working on something uh, together? And he's like, yeah, I'll talk to him. And, you know, there were some talks here and there after a bit. Uh, next thing you know, Ernesto hits number one cigar of the year. Uh, my father calls to congratulate him and he's like, you know, what do I do now? And my dad's like, you know, just focus on, on Encore, focus on your brand, make sure, you know, 
what kind of happened to us doesn't happen to you and uh, stay focused. And he's like, well, I really want to work on that project with Alec and Bradley. And my dad kind of, you know, turned his head like, you know, really? Like kind of one of the biggest, biggest moments for your company. And you still want to work on, on a brand with, with the boys. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. I think we were had already gone down for a meeting and uh, had already started talking about blinds and stuff like that before uh, they hit number one and before that conversation took place. But uh, once he did hit number one, Brad and I thought there's, there's no way he's still doing this project with us, but he still wanted to do it, which is very cool. Yeah. Was it an important step for you guys to kind of sort of step out of the, not out of the family business or necessarily out of, but out of its shadow? you know, and to kind of, this is a, obviously a completely different segue that you guys took by going into the DR, partnering with Ernesto that, you know, it hadn't been done by your father's company. Was this really something that you kind of envisioned all along or how important was it to, to kind of take a project of this, of not to use a word from the last cigar, but of this kind of leap of faith into, uh, in, into a, in a project of this nature? Yeah. Uh, I think that was kind of the whole point with the Alec and Bradley lines is to hit a segment that maybe Alec Bradley doesn't touch. Um, people that maybe have stopped smoking our brand or was never really interested in our brand. So we wanted to do things that are more about us and who we are. And part of that is also providing uh, cigars with different artwork and different blends from different places. So. Um, we don't have a premium cigar that comes out of the Dominican Republic, so we wanted to be the first ones that do it in the company. Is to, and why not work with a, a man more legend than Ernesto Perez Carrillo, given the opportunity? I mean, you guys have talked with so many people. I'm sure you've heard stories about other manufacturers, you know, going to Ernesto and making blends with him, and um, that's where it really all sparks from. Um, so getting to work with someone like him is unbelievable. I mean, he's, he's a legend. To add to that, it, it w really was an opportunity for us to step out of the shadow of Alec Bradley by going to another factory. Um, I've known Ernesto for a while, not all that well, but I, met, I think I met him around when I was like 18. And um, so I had met him many different times and the, Bradley actually came to me saying, I think we should work with Ernesto. And I brought it up to him a couple of times. I know my father brought it up to him a couple of times. And uh, he was always interested and really wanted to do something with us. And he likes the whole idea of the next generation kind of thing. So he was completely in it. And not just that, the weird thing is that when you really look at it, Bradley and I versus Ernesto really have nothing in common except for the love of tobacco. Um, so that's what was also very cool about the project to, to us. You know, Coop off, often jokes around with me. Sometimes I get, uh, I get you know, kind of, starstruck or a little butterflies in my stomach when I'm talking to some of these folks, uh, including, including the gentleman that we've been talking about today. I got the opportunity and the privilege of interviewing Ernesto at the trade show this year, uh, which was just uh, awesome for me. Growing up in the business, like you said, uh, Alec, you, you had the opportunity to meet him when you were younger and everything. Does that, does that ever happen to you guys? Do you guys ever get intimidated or, you know, starstruck uh, from some of these other folks that have, uh, you know, that have, Kind of like the legends in the business, like much like your father is? All the time for me. All the time. I mean, I think the only one so far was Ernesto for me. Um, just because he was someone of more like more of a higher status like that, who I also fell in love with his with his brand. So uh, he's probably the only one and then other people I wouldn't say starstruck, but just more excited to meet for sure. Did you, you know, I know, like I'll say this, Bear was pretty much, when Encore came out, consistently, he thought this was going to get the number one cigar from Aficionado. Uh, and uh, he was, he really loved that cigar, but he, he, and he was calling it right till the end. I mean, when, so you didn't, obviously when he gets a number one cigar, that's a big deal that now he, hey, he's taking you guys on right after, right after that. Like, hey, that's, that's, that's gotta be like. I mean, yeah, that's that's a big honor. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't. I didn't think he would do it after. I thought the project was going to be next. I thought I was going to be done. I didn't think we had a shot. 
And he's got a good memory, Ernesto, too. Well, he'll say sometimes he forgets little details about the blends and stuff, right? But there's little things that he, I can tell you he remembers, too, just from me getting to know him. So that was great that he remembered that project, and, and it wasn't just like vape, you guys, you know, vaporware. It was like this was yeah. something real. So yeah. how soon after they got number one did you guys get to work on this? I, like I, uh, I think I mentioned before, we actually had a meeting with them prior to them getting number one. That's right, yes. Yeah. yeah. And so it already started back. Barely. I mean, a me well, what was going to be an hour meeting turned into, a, I think, a four or five hour meeting the first time we went and sat with Ernesto just because he is the nicest guy ever and will never, <laughs> never kick you out. But um, yeah, so we had started talking. Uh, we had one, you know, five hour meeting, whatever it was. And I, I don't think Bradley or I thought that it was going to happen after that hit. We both were actually rooting for um him to get number one as well so we were we were very excited for him but we also thought that once it hit that probably wasn't going to happen the uh did you guys have a concept of what you wanted to do you know was it something that you pitched to ernesto or did he kind of did you kind of pick his brain for some ideas with that i mean the i i had ideas in my head but you never know which different idea is going to end up being the right one um and ultimately, we wanted to pay homage to Ernesto uh, for what he's done in the industry and what he's now allowing us to do within the industry, getting to work with him. So the gatekeeper is really about Ernesto, um, which is how I pit, how we pitched it to him was we kind of want to do something for you because um, we see this as a big, big deal for us uh, getting to work with him. So if we could pay you know, some sort of respect. And like I said, we like stuff that's kind of retro, paying respect to some old school stuff. Uh, why not pay homage to Ernesto and, and everything that he's done and what, he, what he's con uh, continuing to do with us and with his own brand, BTC. In a sense, Ernesto is a gatekeeper and that's how we kind of viewed it. So hence the name gatekeeper. You know, the, the rappers that Ernesto works with, they're kind of different than what you guys have worked with at Alec Bradley, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and ultimately you went with uh, Ecuador and Habano. Uh, did you guys have any Ecuador and Habano in the portfolio before that? No, no. no I didn't think so. And it's, you know, it's a pretty common rapper, but I, I thought that was the case. Hey, this is something you guys hadn't worked with at Alec Bradley before. Um, so it was kind of a, a unique opportunity there. Yeah. I mean, Ernesto is pretty well known for using that rapper. We wanted to play to his strength. So, why not go with something that he's very familiar with uh, and you know, use it for that exact reason. It's just his, this, a lot of the cigars, like I said, that I'm a fan of uh, from his line, use the Ecuadorian Bono. So it just kind of made sense. Yeah. My, my, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, the interesting is a, a comment that we seem to have to receive a lot at the trade show was um, a lot of people were surprised that they could taste the influence of us as well as Ernesto in the cigar. And it, they, a lot of people said it was a true collaboration because it wasn't so one, one-sided or the other. I'm fair. totally on board with that. I'm totally on board with that. Exact same thing to me. So I'm going to give him credit on that. I think yeah. there was a consensus that Gatekeeper was, um, you know, in years past from the show, there seems to be like that there have been like this, this front runner of cigar of the show, like a cigar that really captured every, everyone's attention for the most part. And, you know, what I, my contention for this year's show, and I think Coop, you can feel free to disagree or agree with it, but um, there really wasn't like that one cigar. There were a couple, but one of the cigars that were kind of that cigar of the show was absolutely, again, not just saying this because we're talking to you gentlemen tonight, but one of those cigars was the gatekeeper. Everyone I talked to, retailers, media alike, and even some other manufacturers we're really high on this particular cigar and for good reason. Um, you know, Coop and I both really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, um, I thought it exactly you took the words out of my mouth guys that I think that it really, it captured the essence of, of, of both of you uh, as an identity and really made something very unique at the same time. That was just a, tr just a tremendous cigar. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I remember actually watching, you know, your guys' show the first one after I the CPR. And I believe Bear, I think the, the term you used was dark horse cigar of the show. So mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, we really appreciate that. Hearing that is unbelievable for us because we're, 
you know, in really good company with everyone else making fantastic cigars. So to, to be put on some, some lists with uh, other people that have done amazing things is uh, it's pretty good, pretty good feeling. Well put, Brad. The reason why I lit up this Gordo tonight, Bear, actually with this one, is because obviously Ernesto is no, the godfather of this size. Like he's, He didn't invent mm-hmm. it, but he really – this is what his forte. Um, and I'm telling you, if you're a fan of Ernesto, and if you're a fan of his big ring gauges, and there's a lot, this blend really – and I'm getting into the middle of this, this size right now. This is just hitting all the cylinders right now. It, it's, a, it's a great medium-strength, medium-bodied cigar. Uh, there's a lot going on right now, uh, especially when you kind of you get some of the smoke going on the palate right now. Bear, I know you were talking a lot about that with uh, Klaus the other night. Mm-hmm. There's a lot going on with this cigar, and you get that nice, the nice smoke production you can get on this is really stimulating a lot of areas of the palate. So um, this big ring gauge size is very, very good. Yeah, it's what Ernesto does. Yeah, uh, it's what he's known for for a good reason. Yep. Yeah, and. Um, what was you guys? You know, I the you know I always like I said I did like the Habano, Mike. I loved that short run 2011, and um, that was one of my favorite ones that he did with this. Uh, this is as good as any Habano cigar I've had from Ernesto, uh, and I think your influence on this thing is it's just I think it's it's you know and not that again not saying Ernesto does a lot of duplicate cigars, but it's just again another avenue of innovation that you're able to find, and, and I think. That's why people are really pleased. And plus, in the end, it's delivering with flavor, which is the most important thing. Absolutely. Thank you. What Coop is secretly wishing and holding back from you guys is that he really wants you guys to release the gatekeeper with Ernesto and the Texas Lancero size, and that would just make I'm, him happy. I'm in, life. man. I'm in. We'll, se- we'll send a bundle to uh, over to you, Coop. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in. We're, we're actually talking about potentially releasing a, a limited amount in another size. Uh, it might not be a Texas Lancero, but – there is maybe something else in the works. Very nice. Very, very nice right now. Um, so the artwork, the artwork is again, um, very unique. Let me see if I can hold that up. Uh, yeah. Very, very. <laughs> tell, tell, tell us a little bit about the imagery yeah. there. The, the, yeah. the, the gold, uh, very strategically placed. Um, and then obviously the, uh, the, the bust on it as well. So tell us a little bit about the imagery and what it kind of, what it stands for and uh, symbolizes. Yeah. Like Alex said before, we see Ernesto as the gatekeeper. So we kind of just wanted to, we look back at some, some old references, some old movies, things like that. And when, when we imagine a gatekeeper, we imagine someone, uh, you know, someone gothic, something just atrocious and, and scary, but kind of beautiful. And uh, I think that's what the, went into the artwork, uh, you know, the gold kind of being Ernesto because, you know, I think everything he touches turns to gold. Uh, number one cigar of the year, number two cigar of the year, I think number four cigar of the year. Uh, so the list kind of goes on. So hopefully, uh, you know, some of his uh, gold rubs off on us and, uh, you know, maybe something, uh, something cool like that happens for us. Very, very, very nice there. Um, and uh, your father made, made a comment about Red Meat Lovers Club. I don't know if that's a tease. I, I have no clue what that's in reference to. <laughs> Interesting. I want to make he sure told it was me before f- the show that he was just going to comment a bunch of crazy things to keep your attention, Coop. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, no, but <laughs> he's he's actually doing it. <laughs> I didn't know. I had to look to see which Alan Rubin it was. <laughs> so. Yeah. Better than so, the other Alan Rubin. Yeah. Santa Clara Allen is in the room as well. Just, just, uh, just What's torture up, him. Yeah. Pop number two. Yeah, and he, and he, and he liked the gatekeeper, by the way, Santa Clara Allen, and he's got a yeah. very, I'd say he's got a discerning palate too. So <laughs> for him to, for him to tell, to say that, that's that's really good there. Um. So yeah, great, great reception. Uh, when's the cigar actually going to be shipping? I'd probably say um, what's the date today? Twentieth. Um. We're hoping for three weeks. That's not bad. That's that's Conserv- pretty good. Conservatively, three weeks. Okay. That's a, so that's so it's a good uh, kind of uh, taking you right into September there. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I know we're not bringing it up yet necessarily, but a lot of stuff started shipping last week, and then we thought we would have a nice uh, little pause between before we had uh, gatekeepers start to to ship. Yep. No, that's good. 
just a final note on the gatekeeper, just to give you an idea about how kind of widely uh, re- well received it was. So uh, as Coop knows, and what we do in the, sh- the retail shop that I work in, uh, we have a staff picks of the month. Mm-hmm. And so inevitably what happens the the last the closing days of the month especially if there's a really nice cigar that some of the guys are looking forward to uh picking as their picks of the month they want to get in first so they'll send the mass text out like this is what i'm picking and there was a couple there was actually two we have a very small step there are two guys that jumped the gun trying to trying to pick the gatekeeper and our inventory director had to uh inform them sorry guys it's uh it's not being shipped yet sorry um uh, <laughs> better luck next time with that um but now with my intel, they watch the show though, unfortunately. But with my intel, maybe I can get in first this time. <laughs> if it wasn't live, you could have edited that out. But <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, that's that's awesome that every, you know people are excited for Gatekeeper to come out. We're extremely excited for it as well. Yeah, no, you guys, you guys definitely definitely should be. Um, and I think uh, you know a lot of us, like I said, who are at the trade show, we we got to smoke this. We're smoking it now. Um, I'm smoking it now. But I think uh, the cigar enthusiast is going to be in for a real treat with this cigar. Um, so uh, very exciting there. You mentioned Lars. So let's kind of get into Lars here. Um, yeah. um, and we talked a lot about this with your dad. But I want to kind of look at it from your perspective. Tell us when your dad came to, you know, came to you about the idea of bringing in Lars and what was your reaction back on that? Oh, I was extremely excited. Um, it's takes us into a different part of the market and the industry that we've never been in before. Uh, my father started out with flavored cigars and kind of went away from that very quickly. And it didn't make, it didn't stay in our lineup after that, but it kind of allows us to venture into a new part of the industry that we've never been in before. And Lars is Lars, is Lars. And until you un- meet him and understand who he is, uh, you just won't get it. And, or until you smoke with cigars, because when people talk about, flavored cigars they have a certain perception but when you smoke a larcine cigar it is nothing that you ever thought it would be completely different so we were extremely excited about that we talk about your dad getting uh was started off in flavor that was the the line that he did after uh after bogey stogies right it was the what was the tagline it was like uh all, none of the fat and all the flavor something like that or yeah something. it was a gourmet dessert cigars Right. Uh, none of the fat, all the flavor. You yeah. got it perfect. Yeah. Any of those laying around still? I've, I've never seen them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you have the same, another cheesy tagline for Bogey Stogies. Uh, the uh, the best bogey you'll have on the golf course. Have you smoked Bogey Stogies? Never found never. that either. Wow. Yeah. No. Wow. You you know, so with, with Lars Teton's, um, I admit, so when I started smoking, I, I maybe had it once or twice, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't have a positive or negative reaction with it, right? But I'm not, a, as Barry will tell you, I'm not someone who was against flavored cigars, but I think you guys hit it on the head. Um, when a lot of us went to that media party, and there were two things. We met Lars, like you said, got to know who he was, which I had a very different opinion than I was expecting with that, yeah. and then tried the cigars, which we had the opportunity to do. I get it. I totally get it now. Um, and it was you were skeptical at first. I remember. I was, I was, I was skeptical. Um, but again, you know, like I said, maybe I had, you know, I hadn't really smoked the large stuff much. Right. But I'm like, well, you know, are these, are these kind of gimmicky cigars? Are they, um, and don't use the G word. We'll we'll get to that later on. Okay. (laughs) But, but then when, you know, like I said, when, when I know when we were there and we were smoking, I'm like, these are good and, and these are really good. Like they're, they're just, they're not aggressive with the flavor, but they, no. they really complemented the blends and allowed some of the complexities to shine. But the, the cool thing that I saw at the party that I observed was the Alec Bradley team was, was enthusiastically yeah. on board with this. It, your whole staff was on board with this. Don't, don't get it wrong. They were all skeptical. at first. I'm they, sure they were. I'm sure they were. Yeah. Everyone yeah. is skeptical. Everyone was skeptical. We ended up sending out samples for them, and call after call from them once they received the samples was, okay, I get it now. And yeah. that's when it all turned. Yeah, and and like I said, meeting Laura's on top of that, I thought he was a, I was I thought he was a recluse, because like, we hadn't seen him for a while. Like he, you know, the brand never went away, but no one had really seen him, so I didn't know if we were going to get this recluse guy. 
Uh, and here we get, we get this guy. He's just a, a fun guy to be around, a, a super nice guy, talented beyond belief, and very enthusiastic about this product, of his product is what I saw. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, going on my take a little bit, um, when I was in my old office, there was a metal skateboard uh, just laying in my office, and it said Lars Hedens on it, and I didn't know what it is or who it is or whatever and next thing you know i see my dad has a lars tedens hat uh sitting at the top of his on top of his desk and weirdly looking through our dropbox photos i see old lars tedens stuff and so i keep seeing lars this is before we were even talking to him and i see lars tedens lars tedens lars tedens and i had to ask my dad like what is the deal with this lars tedens and he's like he's a creative genius like and explain kind of the whole thing that he did uh, at, in the, you know, the late seventies and, and eighties and nineties. And I was, I couldn't believe it. So, uh, weirdly enough, you know, a little bit longer down the road and, and now, uh, now Alec Bradley and our students are, are under the same umbrella. Yep. And, and, uh, you know, the thing is, um, it obviously carried over onto the trade show floor. Yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't like I mean the the uh, the reaction was very positive. I guess as the retailers came through the booths. No, oh, absolutely. We gave Lars Lars his, as people like to call it, his cave. Um, that he got to that he got to stay in, meet with people, play music for them, all that great stuff. Explain the cigars, and it was a really positive experience. I think some people came in not knowing what to expect. And then by the time they left the, the Lars booth, they they got it and they understood it. I I didn't get to go in the booth. With, well, I did get a, a peek in there because the guard wasn't there when I got there. Um, yeah, the bodyguard. The bodyguard, right? But when but here's what that reminded me of that back room is I think I told you guys about we were talking about my dad on the last show, and he yeah. used to drive a lot of the record company people. And when I when I went in there, it reminded me of those old record company offices. That's what it had. A, it had that vibe with just the room looked like a record company office when you went in there. It was yeah. really it took took me back there right away. Yeah, he, cool. he, used to, he used to take me up to to the CBS Records offices, and I'd get to meet some of the executives up there. And oh, that's it was awesome. really so it was really cool to see that as well. Yeah, and it was cool even seeing other manufacturers that used to smoke his cigars come yeah. in just want to see Lars again or or you know learn about him and see you know what he is and and all that aspect so it was it was pretty cool that people in the industry were excited yeah there, there were other manufacturers that waited over 15 minutes to get to see Lars again because they hadn't either seen him or so in so long or a big fan of what he did and I thought that that was crazy within itself that other manufacturers would wait to meet Lars yeah that was a that was a really uh a really, uh, like I said, that's a really good thing to see as well. Um, like I said, a lot of us who have been covering this since like 2010 ish, we this was really our first time we've had to interact with Lars, uh, even though he's yeah. been around a long time. For us, it was, it, he was in a way, it was like dealing with a newcomer, but there are people who go back further than us as well to do that. Exactly. And so, Coop, I know you've had the majority of them so far. Which one are you uh, gravitating toward right now on the Lars line? The SS. I get it. I get it. It's just a different experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The SS is the one I really like. Uh, that's up it, next. That's yeah. up next. And, that, and that's the one you guys, that Cigar Dave grabbed, right? Yeah. So here's a funny story with that, right? I, uh, I ran into, I had a, my little encounter with Cigar Dave, as people know. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was telling me about that cigar, right? We somehow got in large heat and, and he was on board with it, right? Which I was even surprised to hear from him on that, right? And he was telling me about that cigar. And then I saw the video that he did with you guys when he actually smoked that thing. I'm like, wow, he was really telling the, the story about that where, um, yeah, he grabbed that cigar and he, I think he was caught for a loop on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think everyone at the trade show, and uh, this is what I told everyone, it is the most interesting cigar you will smoke at this trade show. It's unlike anything out there. Yeah. I actually, I accidentally, uh, without realizing what I did, handed one to Juan Cancel and <laughs> did not warn him beforehand. And then he came over and motherfucker motherfucked me a little bit uh, for not, not giving him a fair warning before he lit it up. Juan. <laughs> yeah, Juan's, Juan's a good guy. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy. Juan uh, I probably should have warned him a little bit before I, uh, I gave him a cigar. Yeah. Smoke with caution. But I think that cigar, I mean, it threw 
everyone like so i smoked it i knew about it already i wasn't as caught off guard because i hadn't smoked that wasn't the one i had smoked prior to that so i kind of but that was the one i was most interested and it was the one that really you know captured me as well the fats also are pretty good i've been i've been liking a lot of those and those all each have a different character as well those fat lines have you had the sun fuka that one i have not had no i did i did have that yes i did have that one i had that one actually at the party yeah what did you think really liked it i i really enjoyed that one as well Yeah. yeah Yeah, um, because I, I remember when, when the cigars were out there, I was just talking to Lars about, you know, wait, which one should I smoke? And he recommended that one to me. Yeah. Uh, and it had a nice, like, what I liked about that cigar, that was when we really got a lot of the complexities of the of those cigars, mm-hmm. um, where, you know, it wasn't like smoking a sweet tip cigar, is what I'm saying. It, this was like smoking the, these, uh, like I said, he calls these conditioned. Yeah. And I just felt this was something really different as well. I, I think for the people that, that are watching, if you are skeptical on the Lars line, um, it is not like any of the other flavored cigars. It has its own unique characteristics in terms of the experience. So you really get both the, the flavor of the tobacco and then you get whatever is added into it as well. So you get a very nice added ambiance and it's very, it, it, it just uh, kind of molds together very well and it's not so overpowering and it's not gonna, not everyone in the room is gonna be able to smell it. So it's kind of its own unique thing within the industry. And the cool thing about it is you can go throughout the line and with some, if you want a little bit more flavoring, there's an offering for that. Or if you want something just nice and subtle that just really enhances the, the experience, there's that as well, which is very cool. And then there's the uh, sweet and spicy that is like nothing else in its own, in its own place. But, itself yeah and i'd also encourage folks to if you smoke one of these and it's not to your liking don't dismiss the whole line yeah, uh because they're all very different uh even the fats different. the fats with the, those fats are all really different too even in there the thing is like brad and i are purists and we smoke you know regular premium cigars and when we started lighting these up we were insanely surprised yeah and i think most people that have tried them so far have been yeah yeah it's, it's, I think you could speak to that, Coop. Yeah, no, I, I could definitely too. And I remember I was talking to Jack. Uh, you know, Jack came from the cigar media. Um, you guys hired him as a, as a as a as a rep out with West, and he was totally on board with it. Like be, even before I had lit up my Lars Teachings that night, uh, he was like, "You got to try. You make sure you try this before you leave the party." Is what he was saying to me. Yeah, um, I think Bear's about to put down whatever he's smoking. He's going to light up that. Smoke. I, I I think I have to at this point. You know. Like I don't want to, I don't want to put down the blind faith, man. I'm really enjoying it, but the way this is getting talked I will, up I now, I feel disrespected if you put it down to try the Lars. I will not. Okay. The uh, the thing about uh, this the cigar, the first Lars Teton uh, cigar that I smoked was the Grass at the media event, and um, uh, I think uh, it was on it was on the show with uh, with Aaron Coop that uh, he was talking about. I guess some of the conditioning that goes into it, uh, some of the material costs like just like this obscene amount of money. Over $30,000 like, for a quart. Of yeah. one yeah. <laughs> now, I, I haven't smoked the grass yet. I got to admit that I haven't smoked that one yet. I have it. I haven't smoked it, though. It's, it's pretty good, Coop. more conditioned cigars, but has a great aroma and is a great experience. And Anna Jonathan Lipson favorite as well. Yeah, uh, I think Jonathan Lipson has smoked more than um, anyone has gotten to try yet. Yeah, pretty much. Clearly, right. he's making a big bucks there. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, well, here I go, guys. I'm gonna do the SS. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. This. Uh, so as bear as bear lights up that as well. Um, the uh, start hearing noises from bear. <laughs> yeah, it has a. It, it will. There's an onset where you're gonna get with that cigar. Yeah. How about you guys? What's your favorite of the Lars lines? Uh, I'm more of a Cubagua, like early morning smoker on the way to work with coffee, uh, nice, nice and mellow and, and sweet. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's between the Sun Fuka and the sweet and spicy. Uh, when I'm just looking for a great smoke from the Lars line, I definitely go with the Sun Fuka. And when I'm looking for that sweet and spicy, just cause that's something that, you know, when you're in the mood for it, you want it. That's, that's something I got to grab. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that's the, the usually the reaction. Sometimes in a, in a great way, and sometimes in a not so great way. But it, it's always you're always gonna get that reaction. 
All right, so guys, I grew up in I grew up in El Paso, Texas, and um, so yeah. <laughs> so we used to have we used to call it candy, but it wasn't all right. So there was this this uh, kind of uh, it was a brand called Picolin, but basically it was like uh, a citrus uh, and chili powder candied, you know, a citrus and chili powder like seasoning that would go all over this candied mango, candied watermelon. That's what this tastes like. Not the what, not the fruit so much, but the the seasoning. That's what this tastes like. The citrus, chili pepper thing going yeah. on. <laughs> Just this so is, you know, this is cool. Is, there is Carolina <laughs> Reaper, ghost pepper, scorpion pepper, and habaneros on that on that cigar. I believe it. Whew. It's great. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. When I when I first tried one of the original ones, I. Like for me, it's just too much. For, I, I'm not good with spicy, and I never have been. Uh, oh, so I, I had two puffs, and I my my mouth just could not take it. By the way, that scorpion pepper is a key ingredient in the seasoned salt. By the way. Oh yes, uh, it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So listen, if for, for for folks who are sick of rice and beans, okay, my wife made rice and beans. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of it. I don't know why she made it, but uh, it wasn't wasn't like. I wasn't doing handstands over it. I stuck a little of that seasoned salt in there, and it's uh, it does everything. It will make everything better. I, I was even saying how it makes McDonald's fries better. Yeah, uh, I got so. some, little, some of the large spice right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. All, that's that's the that's the that's the seasoning that I got from the media event. And man, that yeah. stuff on that stuff on some salmon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And chicken. Yeah. Off uh, the chain. I've oh, been ra I've been raving about it. it's the best seasoned salt I've ever had. Uh, and by the way, just for folks who know, we will have Lars on uh, the, the Thursday show in October. I think we have him October third or October tenth, but I'll I'll put that out there Ooh. for sure. So yeah, that'll be music that'll be fun. Oh, you got to get him playing. So yeah, we were talking about this. Um, yeah, I actually was. Uh, we were driving home from church, right? And um. <laughs> I, I'm going to try to tell the story correctly. My wife said I didn't tell it correctly the last time. And um, basically, my wife and I each got new cars, right? Mm -hmm. um, she never gets to drive in my car, right? Um, so she said, hey, can we take your car to church? We, we always take my car, her car. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And But the, the deal is whose car we're in controls the music. So I basically had uh, – I had basically had um, Lars Keaton queued up on YouTube <laughs> <laughs> and I put it on in the car <laughs> and my wife's like, who is this? She's like, <laughs> where did you find this from? And I go, oh, that's Lars Keaton. And she knew of Lars Keaton because she does a lot of the editing of the articles for me. Um, she's ah. like, so she's like, he does music. So I said, don't you remember from the article? He, the picture goes, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I was playing that on the way home from church. <laughs> <laughs> when's he okay. when's he gonna be on primetime coop uh october it is october 3rd or october 10th i it'll, will uh, it'll be cooler by then you should totally rock a, a pink sweater in honor of the guest uh we will pink will be uh I'm, I'm for sure gonna have a pink theme in there yes we will have something pink in there but i got Lars wears that that he kind of wears that sweater around his neck kind of look uh yeah and the, and the signature cowboy hat he literally told me he does it just look like an asshole <laughs> <laughs> jokingly obviously but that, those were his words to me the videos he shot with you guys uh i mean he was torturing you alec that day uh he was walking oh, around the yeah. offices that day it was that was uh, that was great that afternoon uh yeah he he enjoys that yeah he definitely enjoys torturing me a little bit yep we we definitely have to talk about another aspect of the Lars Teeden cigars because I, I I we can't we can't let you guys off the hook. I, tell me that, tell me that you guys have the same effect when you guys look at all the labels, man. That there's just like so much going on. Like seriously, like you can have like an epileptic seizure if <laughs> yeah. you stare too long at these things. There's just so much going on. The stimulation, the overstimulation from these these labels so, just have to be. Lars actually like, designed all the all the bands himself, and. Um, the pictures that are on the band are actually all of him throughout the years. Wow. Yeah. So we, we really wanted to, to keep uh, as much original artwork and all the blends as original as we could from, from back then. So um, there's a trying to, to find, trying to find all that information was, was pretty tough. 
There's a photo of him on the SS. This the him, I guess, in very, very when he was very, very young. He looks like a young Mads Mickelson from Casino Royale in 007. Yeah. Yes. Le Chiffre. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that's who it was. That's awesome. That's him. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Some people cannot believe that you know some of the pictures were were him, um, but it is you know unbelievable. Hey. Something in its own. Yeah, and and. I was I had a same a first the opinion of the busy bands. I didn't know if they were gonna work, right? Then I met Lars, uh, kind of got to understand it. And then when I really started looking at these bands, um, they are very creative. And they 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 took me back to like the '80s in New York, where you go into uh, um, the Soho district, the Greenwich Village district. Uh, where, where, that's where you used to go buy all the import music. Um, there was no internet. Then we go into New York City and we buy import albums, and there were all these uh these posters up around the city, uh, and around the record stores that kind of looked like this. Again, it kind of had that vibe going with it, which was really kind of cool. And I kind of thought about it. Yeah, Lars is is from New York, so that really plays into kind of who he is. So yep. All the all the artwork is really is really true to to who Lars is as a person. Yeah, I think he's from. Um upstate new york and uh ended up living in manhattan for a lot of years i, I could see it i could definitely see it there yeah. um yeah just because this is not so nostalgic for me the flavor and the taste of it man I, I gotta say that i'm enjoying this more than i enjoyed the grass yeah and the, the and the siri d i smoked the siri d as well um the question is, is would you smoke this again oh yeah i would absolutely yeah. i'm gonna yeah. light up that you got me my i want to light mine up next <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. I think, man, like I said, it's very, it's very, it's very nostalgic for me. This is actually really nice. This is interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. very, uni it's very unique. Uh, and it's kind of funny because if I, if I was on a table, right, and I was going to pick a Lars Keaton cigar to smoke, not knowing anything about it, this might be the last one I pick, right? Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's the biggest, it was like the biggest revelation of the whole line there. <laughs> Yeah. I just want to point out, I'm on my third Corona right now, and Brad is still smoking that Max that's nine and a quarter inches long. <laughs> I'm getting there. Yeah. I'm getting there. All right. Uh, Barry, anything else on Lars Keith? I want to turn to one more thing uh, on this before we get into a couple of the other topics. Um, so, like, just, just to just – to... Just to clarify, when you guys, when your your father was talking to you guys about the acquisition and everything, and making uh, Lars Teton a part of uh, Al the Alec Bradley family, did the discussion always include having Lars stay on as a part of the identity of the brand and in a bigger part of the company? Every single conversation included Lars, yeah, in being in it. Um, when my father originally met Lars, um, I think they were in the basement of a cigar lounge. They were supposed to meet at like 11 o'clock at night. Lars showed up at 2 or 3 in the morning. Um, they sat for like four or five hours till the sun came up. And um, from that point on, my dad knew that he just, you know, was going to be friends with Lars for a long time. And then when this opportunity came up, and because my dad has, had always been a fan, he collected the skateboards, the hats, a bunch of the different stuff. He always wanted Lars to be on board on, in every aspect of it. Lars created the bands. He went down to the factories. He uh, helped. He helped work on the blends to bring it back to you know the original as close as possible, and did everything from soup to nuts. So Lars is the conversation of Lars being a, you know, being a part of it and staying a part of it was was not, it was, was not even a question. Fantastic. Yep. There was another cigar that you guys came out with um, that I think was a sleeper. Uh, it came out before the show. Yep. And I think a lot of us were, I know I was really surprised. I saw it got a really uh, high score from the half wheel guys. And, and I totally, I'm on board. That project 40, um, one of the best values that's come out in 2019, without question. Um, tremendous. Out of right now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's actually coming out of uh, Jesus Fuego's factory. Yeah. So you got and the Brazilian so influence in there. Yeah. You got something Brazilian going on in there. Yep, and that's something we haven't talked about yet. All of the Lars stuff also is coming out of Pedro Pe Pe Suegos factory. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. So it's been doing very, very well for us. Uh, I've been traveling the past two weeks uh, out in New England and then just got back from Wisconsin, and people have been doing great with it and been getting a lot of compliments. It's really an everyday cigar, um, so it's it's doing very, very well for us, and we're, we're really excited about it. 
Yeah, it was, uh, like I said, it was, um, I, again, it was something I think a lot of us who hadn't smoked it uh, were really, really pleased with it as well. And again, a different type of cigar with more of the Brazilian tobacco influence that Jesus Fuego is known for. Exactly, yeah. Yep. By the way, Juan Cancel is in the chat room. Love it. What yeah. do you say about the sweet and spicy? Anything? No, I said I love the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can't find his comment. Did he, did he write anything? I can't. I'll have to see on that. I think Juan's still living in the 80s. I still live in the 80s. He lives <laughs> in the Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I live in the past is what I've been told. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, Barry. Renaissance man, Coop. You're a renaissance man. A renaissance man, man. yeah. So, uh, no, that's, that's, like I said, I think, it again, it showed, uh, and, and I love the whole concept of the Project 40 concept your dad kind of put on that brand as well. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he always has something meaningful behind, uh, behind the Alec Bradley brands. And, uh, that's just kind of how, you know, how we live our life. Uh, how he taught us growing up is, is really, you know, you control your own happiness and, uh, control your own future and, and how things are going to work out for you. Uh, nothing is really by, by fate, but you control your own destiny. So, which is kind of the theme behind Project 40. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, and uh, it's kind of an experimental series, and again, kind of uh, experimental. You, you know, it was interesting, because, re- and I know this came up with your dad, too. All the releases this year did not come out of Racist, which was like a first for you guys. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It really goes back to, uh, like you said before, we're trying to do different things and uh, continually try to make people interested and get excited. So uh, part of that is trying different blends and working with different factories, and that's uh, – that's how we're going to continue to do it. Very nice. Bear, anything else we want to hit in this segment? No, man. I'm just – I put that down for a second, not because I'm disliking it, just because it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you, the watermelon yeah, sweetness, sweet. you, you nailed it with that watermelon sweetness with that, actually. It's, like, it's, that was the sweetness. It's, I, it's, yeah. very, it's very nostalgic for me. This is almost like yeah. – But this is – Crazy, man. This is sweet, Bear, spicy. Once you get about uh, a third of the way in, the, the spiciness start, starts to mellow out a little bit. Oh, I, I can handle I can handle the heat. That's not that, that that I mean honestly, that's truly what I'm enjoying about it. It's just uh, um, I, I, I'm I'm not gonna lie. I'm not trying to wax poetic or be too melodramatic about this, but I, I'm 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 having an emotional connection right now, and I'm. <laughs> I love I, it. I don't think you. I don't think you've looked up since you've been smoking the cigar. I, I so just like, keep. I just keep looking at it. I'm just yeah. keep. I know. I just it. I'm. I'm. I'm really just. I'm just. I'm having an enthralling experience here, guys. This is. This is. This is really. This is, this yeah. Is, this I, is really I, I fantastic. Enjoy. It really is. It really is. It's great. It really is. I'm. I, I'm. I'm blown away in so many. In so many different ways, and and uh, I'm having. I'm truly having an emotional experience right now. This is. This is. This is really. Take back to your childhood. Oh yeah, man. It really. I mean, just you know, again, not to to be too melodramatic or bring it down around this, but you know, like on the heels of no, the, the heels of the you know the tragedy in my hometown just a few weeks ago, and stuff, and yeah. you know, just been thinking a lot about home, a lot about my friends and family and stuff that are still there and stuff. It's just. It's taking me back, man. And this is. Uh, this is man. I'm glad. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys encouraged me to light this up. I'm. Uh, yeah. This is. This is. This is one for the bucks for sure. Okay. Good yeah, man. All right. Hey Bear, can you do the sponsor thing here? Absolutely. Which one are we doing? Uh, Michaels. Absolutely. I okay. can do it. Okay. Great. So, so we're gonna take a quick break and uh, check in with one of our sponsors, which happens to be Michaels Tobacco. Michaels Tobacco, with just over a decade of ownership. Michael's has become the premier tobacconist for the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area and cigar patrons the world over. With two convenient locations in Euless, just a quick jaunt from DFW Airport and Keller, Texas, Michael's Tobacco stands as a beacon for the Texas cigar retailer. Michael's was the very first cigar lounge in the state of Texas to add a full bar to its ever list of growing accommodations. Proprietor Mike Peacock is a former IPCPR, now PCA board member, and has now made Michael's a family affair by having his son Bob join the ownership force. Under general manager and master story Tracy Spence's leadership at Michael's, his self-proclaimed greatest accomplishment has been assembling, quote, the greatest team in the cigar industry 
uh, retail business, unquote, as well as build some of the finest relationships with the industry's most respected individuals, like our two distinguished guests. Inventory director Jason Fields handles and maintains two of the area's proudest humidors, containing premium cigars for everyone from the everyday smoker to the most ardent collector of rare bureaus. Under Mike, Bob, Tracy, and Jason's example, they have enlisted a staff of Kevin, Austin, myself, Joe, and Solace, and Brandon that collectively boast over 80 years of combined industry experience. Together, they have brought together a true and blessed mainstay for their respective communities. Whether you're celebrating an anniversary, birthday, hole-in-one, or just a desire to relax, Michael's Tobacco will become will have the perfect cigar waiting with an exquisite beverage pairing and lively conversation. My, visit michaelstobacco.com for more details and a calendar of upcoming events. Michael's Tobacco, not just a cigar shop, but the perfect blend of Texas hospitality and the days of yore. Welcome back to Primetime Special Edition number 59. We have Alec and Bradley Rubin as our special guests here. Um, and uh, Bear and I have now lit up Dolores Keaton SS. And just a comment from Juan Cancel. He thought Alec gave you a gag cigar, hence me motherfucking him. <laughs> oh geez <laughs> anyway <laughs> um so you know there's a lot going on in the industry right now guys as 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 um you know and we've been asking a lot of our guests lately to kind of weigh in on some thoughts here uh so we have a few industry topics some of them are i think are, are obviously some things that are in, in the forefront and then we have a couple of other things that are, are going on as well um i guess we'll kind of just get right into it um pca Cigar Con, what, what are your thoughts of that um, right now? Um, what were your thoughts of the announcement and just how it all went down? And what do you think about it uh, going forward? For me, um, it, it's hard for me because I, do I necessarily think that Cigar Con is the best option for, because I understand what they're doing. They need to raise money for the effort against FDA. I understand that 100%. Do I think Cigar Con is the best way to do it? Maybe, maybe not, but I haven't heard necessarily any other options or better options that anyone has proposed at the moment. So do I think that it could be a good thing if it helps generate uh, money for the, the fight against FDA? Yeah, absolutely I do. Do I think that there are some potential flaws with it? Yeah, I think that as well. But the, the main thing, the main thing for me really is I want to see this this industry survive and thrive, and if this is you know the means to get that done, it makes it okay in my book, even though there are obvious obvious flaws to uh, to to cigar con. Do you guys think that you know one of the, the one of the key cornerstones to the cigar con specifically? And PCA uh, to a certain extent as well is to uh, is is more engagement, engagement all around, engagement with the retailer, yeah. engagement with the consumer, education being the forefront of that to combat the FDA, and uh, obviously funds from CigarCon will go towards that and everything. But don't you? Th uh, my opinion is, and I just want to see if you guys have a similar opinion or or, or, or disagreement in it that there this may not be the best forum for this type of level of engagement there are other opportunities there are 11 other months out of the year there are hundreds of events throughout the year uh that are consumer driven and consumer based that might be a better uh, a better stage for pca to enlist that type of engagement yeah absolutely uh i think you got that 100 percent right uh you know we we do this like you said all all throughout the year um doing events and doing uh different multi-vendor events. So we want really want people to come out to those events. Um, we are at the now PCA where we are there to, uh, you know, work with the retailers and, and you know, present new cigars and uh, try and grow our business. And not all the booths are set up to work for uh, consumer engagement. So it does kind of take away what we are usually there to do. But like Alex said, if this is what is overall best for the industry, and you know we don't we don't know any better. We're we're uh, just entering the business only a few years, so um, we don't have all that knowledge and what is the best for the future of, of this industry. But if this is one step into you know fighting the FDA and, and working on legislation, then this is uh, this is what we'll do. But I do agree that it kind of takes away from what we're trying to do, and we would like people out at 
all the other things that we are doing. Um, but at the end of the day, the industry is, is what provides for all of our families. Coop, if I may. Um, so what we're doing tonight is an example of that engagement. While there are, there are a lot of folks tuned in live for this interview um, that are, you know, there are some industry folks like your father that are tuning in, Juan Cancel, as we mentioned a moment ago, and some others. But a, a, most of our audience, a bulk of our audience, and a lot of people tuned in tonight are consumers. And they're receiving that engagement from two amazing, young, vibrant, second generation brand owners. Um, you know, what is your opinion on the role that online media or media in general has taken in this industry and can help? and curtail that engagement that PCA is seeking. Uh, you want me to take this? Yeah, go for it. I'll go next. Uh, I think that the media is a very, very important part of, in what we do. Um, I'm sure before there was, you know, you guys and, and some other different shows, um, it, it would be hard to get that engagement. Not everyone is able to make it out to an event. Or maybe they don't come to your part of town. So to have online media where we can, Did we lose the, vo the sound again? I believe so. We, yep, they may have froze again. Okay, I think they're coming back. Uh, we lost, uh, you guys froze up. Oh, did we? Okay, you're back. It sounds like you're back. Okay. You okay, go it? ahead. Uh, talk. Okay. <laughs> well, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were going, uh, Bradley, you were going into um, where online media uh, has has been a way to connect to, to the consumer and ha, you know, yeah. has been in the past and you, you were, you were finishing your thought there. Yeah. So you guys are, I think very, a very important part in, in what we do. Um, without you guys, there's who knows how many thousands and thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, however, whatever the number is that may never get to meet us if they want to, but they get to see who we are um, through this part of, of the industry through online media. Um, they get to learn about new cigars and learn about the blends and every aspect you guys cover is what we're trying to get our message out. So you guys do a lot of the things that we're trying to do on our own, which is get our message out. And I feel that um, just to add in, uh, people like to be emotionally connected to brands that they, that they enjoy. And like Brad said, maybe we're not in the area of, you know, a shop that someone might get, you know, might go out to an event or they don't have the chance to go out to an event that we do. You guys provide a platform that no one else does. Like online media uh, provides a platform that nothing else does that we're able to, people are able to see who we are and, you know, maybe connect with us. Maybe they like who we are, maybe they don't, but this gives them the opportunity to, to really make that decision. Is there a scenario like, let us say there was a scenario where online media was at, not at the trade show next year for whatever reason. Yeah. What effect do you think that would have on the industry? I think that would have a large effect on the industry. Uh, online media not being there because you guys are spreading the word of what's coming out of the trade show. If online media is not there and you guys aren't, you know, you, you guys have shows, you guys have, your own shows before the trade show and then right after recapping everything that's going on, things that you smoke, things that you liked. If that's not going on, people aren't seeing what's coming out until they go to their local shop and maybe their local shop didn't bring in everything that came out of the trade show. Maybe there's something they want to try and they might find somewhere else that, that might carry it or whatever it may be. And it really gives them the opportunity to know what's out there and what they want to, what they want to give a try based off your guys' recommendations or what you what you said about it so i think it's, it's very important that you guys do that i mean you guys have followed online media probably back from your college days right i mean so you guys were yeah. always on board with that yeah absolutely that's how yeah. i figured out what, what what i was going to try and uh i didn't have too many cigar shops near near me but when i was in orlando and when i was in orlando we would go to coronas and that gave us the opportunity to see what else is out there because especially at coronas there's a gazillion cigars so how do you know what to pick besides going to online media and seeing what they're talking about at that time yeah and um you know you guys weren't always like that though i mean you guys it's really the last couple of years where i've seen you guys really step the game up in there as well i mean you guys have always been responsive to online media mm -hmm. but it seems like the last couple of years 
and, and it was a comment in the chat room is the consumers love to put uh, the face on the cigar, the name to the face, uh, connect yeah. the conduit. And I think you guys have been really doing a, a great job of this the last couple of years, what we're seeing. Uh, and like I, I mentioned earlier, that whole fun side of the company and, and just, you know, people are really getting to know everyone now and Alec Bradley, which I think is, is great for us uh, and for, the, for, for everyone who smokes cigars. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, you guys were both at our, at the party before the, the day before the trade show. And that was part of the reason that we wanted to do it is because we see you guys as being such an important part of our industry that if we could one, do something fun, do something where we all get to hang out and smoke cigars and have a couple drinks uh, and, you know, get, show you guys how important that you are and then just have a good time. It, it really is a, a home run for, for all of us. And while like we just had, it is important for how important you guys are to the industry. Um, and I, I know you've talked about this before on previous shows about interviewing while at the trade show, um, how that could, you know, some people are iffy on that um, because it sometimes can take away from what we're doing. That's why we figured let's have a party and let's let everyone have that time to interview and, and get all those things out of the way. So, you know, we'll, we can do what we want at the trade show and you guys can have more time to focus on other people uh, during the trade show as well. Yeah, it was a very good thing that you guys did because it, 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 there was a fun party aspect that I don't remember, but there was also a lot of, uh, you know, we were, lear we were learning about these releases. Like I said, we talked about, we were learning about the gatekeeper. We were learning about the Lars Tetons that, that night. Um, and it was, the time was taken to that, which I think there was a very valuable, like we wouldn't have gotten maybe 30 minutes in a trade show booth to get that type of attention. So it was extremely beneficial. I could say from my point of view, I'm, I'm sure I could speak for others as well on that. Yeah. Cool. Speak for Malku. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I haven't heard anyone that, I mean, I haven't heard anyone say this, this, everyone was just raving about that party. Um, and like I said, it was very generous what you guys did on top of that. But, but again, I think it was the, the interaction and the experience that it, that it helped us do our jobs better. We, right. we just wanted everyone to have a good time before, you know, we went to work the day before, you know, the day of the trade show. It was just a, it was a good time. It was relaxing. It wasn't serious. And I thought that there was a lot of great conversations that came out of it. And a lot of people really enjoyed it. Oh, great. Bradley, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you and I had an extensive conversation at that party where um, you were, you, the impression that I got is you're a very, you're a heavy consumer of of a lot of media, not just online, not just online and everything, not to keep tooting our own horns here, but you, you know, you've, you've taken in a lot, you humbled me by saying that you've even watched my show, which I was very great, grateful for and everything. Uh, Alec, I didn't have that same opportunity with you, but is that something that's kind of cross culture, Alec, that you, you, you uh, engage and consume a lot as well? And is that kind of spread throughout the company as a whole? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Brad is definitely the one that pulled me more into it because he was so heavily into it and I was a little bit further away and Brad really, Brad really pulled me into it, into consuming all this media and um, really getting to know that, you know, that side of the industry. And um, I, I love it personally. I spent a lot of time going through, I mean, I watched already an hour and a half of the three hour show from last week. So. <laughs> few more days you'll have it knocked out no worries <laughs> oh no that was just uh this morning i watched an hour and a half of it before i got to work i'll probably finish it tonight uh fast food segment's gonna be uh epic we're gonna <laughs> oh god uh, yeah <laughs> now you guys we've talked to you guys a lot about um we talked a little bit at the beginning of the show you guys yeah she spoke a lot of alec browley but you guys i know when we talked last time you guys smoke a lot of what's on the market right now. You don't just smoke Alec Brown. You guys are really the type of guys that go and and try everything. It's uh, is the impression I got when we talked. I think this entire humidor right behind me is full of, of other companies' cigars. Um, I have a full warehouse, obviously, in the back. I can go grab whatever I want. I have another humidor here that has uh, all Alec Bradley in it, but his favorites. Yeah, just just all Coronas and Lanceros in there, basically. But um, there you yeah, go. I, put, put a few yeah, Gordos think, in there. I think everything in the, in the humidor behind me is all other company cigars. And when I first started um, smoking cigars, when I when I turned 18, I spent a lot of time in my local shop and I would kind of work for free and they would unban cigars and um, have me try them. And that's how I developed my palate. So I didn't know what I was smoking. There was no bias toward it. 
and I got to try half of the humidor and really that's how I spent my time developing my palate and learning that you got you got to smoke everything because as a you know as a cigar nerd if you're not smoking other people's stuff what what you know do you truly do you truly love the you know do you have a passion for the cigars if I remember and understand correctly, Alec, your first cigar was actually a 601 Blue label, right? Uh, not my first cigar. That's the first one that almost made me sick. <laughs> it was a 601 Blue followed by a La Riqueza Double Corona. Oh, my. And <laughs> my, my head was spinning. My head was spinning that day. Do you remember? I mean, it's it's probably been a while. What Do you remember what your actual first cigar was? Yeah, it was a Max Nano. Uh, and yours, Brad? Uh, a Tempest Lancero, which I did not really understand how to smoke a cigar. Uh, just, it's not, like, it wasn't natural for me, so it took me a couple tries, but Alec actually taught me how to properly smoke a cigar when he said, like, you know, like you're drinking water out of a straw, just don't inhale the water, and that's really what made it click, but a Tempest, a Tempest Lancero that I didn't properly get to experience. At least you started with the right Vitola, though, Brad. You're, exactly. You're, you're solid. Exactly. Still <laughs> on the hunt for those cigars, actually. Very much on the hunt for those. Yeah. At the trade show this year, did you guys get a chance to try any cigars? Were there some things that impressed you guys out there? Um, let's see. What did I try? I tried that new Trinidad. The Espiritu? Uh, yeah. That was very interesting. Um, as what else did I get to try? There's a few things I tried. I just can't remember. Uh, was, there was a new there was a new Viaje this year as well, right? Or was it, maybe it was like a international release. The the, yeah. the Chinese release. Yeah. yeah the Chinese they didn't. Re- yeah, they didn't release that. But the uh, the China cigar. Yeah, Andre gave me one of those. Yeah, that thing's awesome. Yeah, um, and it it was very good. I told me he needs to release it here. Yeah. I'm yeah. Gonna be- I'm going to be annoying him for a box for sure. Yeah. And there's, there's pictures of it on the Viaje IPCVR article on Coop if folks want to see that, that China release. I don't know yeah. if he had an official name for it. It was just called the China release, I think. Not, I think it was like the Dragon or something. Yes, like yes, that. You're right. yes. Was that what it was, the Dragon? It was and something with I, that, but I don't think he can use the Dragon name here. No. And then yeah. I, had, I also had that re-release of that uh, the Nesta Miranda. The I special was, selection? I was really surprised by that cigar. Yeah, I think. Uh, I know it's a re-release. I I don't know what they did to it. I thought it was a little bit beefed up from what it used to be. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. really good. Yeah, you guys need to try the new Donolino Africas, man. Yeah, yeah it's I a completely that. different blend. Oh man, that thing's off the chain. So good. I'll keep an eye out. I think the only thing, the only new thing I had at the trade show, uh, I'm not saying this because he's watching, but the Sir Robert Peel the protocol was pretty fantastic. Oh yeah, I did have that. That was great. I was, I was a fan of that. And then this past week, I was just in Wisconsin, and I saw Ricky Rodriguez. He gave me the CAO session, uh, which I enjoyed. And I haven't tried it yet, but I'm very excited. The La Coalition uh, Crown Heads, uh, Miguel from Crown Heads gave that to me. So that's uh, what I'll be smoking sometime this week. Also, uh, what was Espinosa's new cigar? I think I had I had that as well. The uh, Seis Provincias, uh, MTZ. Yeah, new release. MTZ. I had that also, yeah. Junior, yeah. Junior gave me one of those, and that was excellent. Yeah, that uh, I haven't smoked mine yet. I do have it. Um, Try it. It was really good. Uh, yeah, no, and I like the one they did last year as well. That and the packaging they did on that was really cool. It had the Cuban yes. style doors yeah. on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had a lot more than I thought I did. Yeah, I'm sure there's more that I can't even remember right now. Yeah. But for anyone that's listening. We talked about a lot of cigars, but Smoke Gatekeeper and Blind Faith and Mars <laughs> Keatons and Project 40 and Magic Toast, and then go try all those cigars. Uh, and I would tell you, you'd be missing out if you don't try any of those cigars. Yeah, yes. I mean, that's sincere. Good plug, Brad. Good plug. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would definitely uh, encourage you to. Um, and uh, one nice plug. <laughs> Juan may be sober tonight in the room. This is the first. I know, man. It's kind yeah. Of... No, no yeah. yeah. No, I know. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, another thing that kind of comes up a lot um, is cigar scoring. Like, there's a lot made of cigar scoring. Yeah. What are your thoughts on scoring cigars? And num- do you guys pay attention to numbers? Are they important? Are they overrated? What do you guys think of that? They're all of the above. Um, everyone has their own different way of scoring. 
Everyone as, has as, as we all know, developed the palettes has the most confusing scoring of anyone out there. <laughs> uh, still don't understand it. But so. everyone keeps talking about it, Brad. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and then half will probably, at least for us, has the toughest scoring. But they do. Yep. But like you saw uh, and said before, Coop, uh, great rating on Project Forty. So they got that one right. I could say that they're really good with that. Yeah. So everyone has their own ratings. Uh, you know, obviously, we always hope for a great rating from everyone. Uh, doesn't mean it's anything less coming from someone else. Um, whoever your viewers and readers and listeners are, uh, they are, and they and they listen to you or watch you for whatever reason or read your articles for 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 a certain reason. And uh, so, and ratings from everyone are definitely important for for sure. Yep. Uh- Guys, just to keep it away from the uh, the the very interesting, and we could again keep up a really nice dialogue because I, I think they're I think developing palace is, is a, I love their scoring system because it does generate conversation. But on, on the hundred on the hundred the the hundred point scale, which is most widely used, yeah, um, and everything, and the the quest seems to be for that that ninety plus right that ninety plus rating is. Always is kind of what gains you know writing and stuff. Where where's the line for you personally? Where you where you're kind of let down, so to speak. Like, is it is like where you're like, God, did they not even did, did they did they hate the cigar? Like, and the, the the point of this discussion is, I had an interesting interesting discussion. I write reviews as as some of the people may know for Cigar Dojo, and and one of the ratings I gave was an 88, which is a is a is a good score for me. And I I, I truly enjoyed that cigar. And they they the, the comment to me right back was I thought you like you said you liked the cigar and you gave it an eighty eight. And I was like, I did like the cigar and it was an eighty eight. So where's the line of demarcation for you guys personally where you kind of like, oh, they really they enjoyed the cigar, but uh, or then now you're disappointed with the, the actual score. What's the what's the line for you guys personally? So the funny thing for me is you hit the nail on the head. For me, anything below an 88 means that they probably did not truly enjoy the cigar. In my, just my personal opinion. Right. At the same time, someone once said to me, I would love to see CS get a 32 rating just to see what kind of spark that would create for the amount of people that would have to go try something that was only rated at 32. I've heard that from a lot of manufacturers on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think there's two ways to, to look at the ratings and, you know, what, like you asked, Bear, you asked personally, um, you know, where's that line? And I would agree that somewhere between, let's say, like an 85 to a 90 is, you know, that that person personally likes it. But to the people that are reading your, your reviews, if you score it below 90, then you don't like it that much. So, I think in I in, in terms of the manufacturer side, um, because people are are uh, buying your cigars or our cigars based off your guys' recommendations, um, nine ninety and up is usually what's gonna get someone to go up and be like, okay, I, I need to try that cigar. I agree with that. Fair point. Fair point for sure. Fair. I'm gonna audible this one, and I moved. The other one kind of falls in with the next one. So that's okay. why I, I, all right. I've heard, I've gotten word of this, uh, guys, of, of a collaboration called the Glenn Fittich collaboration. What's that all about? All I know is I just heard something about it for the first time this week. So you must have heard something before I did. Well, I'm hearing about it for the first time right now. So you guys both know something that I don't know. Okay, so it's not any- really anything I can speak on. Basically, what you just said is everything I know. So if you know more than it, than that, more than me, feel free to share. So this is not a project that you can confirm or deny is in the works. I didn't even know it was in the works. If it is, so I got I some. In, I got some intel on this. That's all. But that's all the intel I have. Is it? Is I mean, club. you from who? That's yeah, a, yeah. Uh, I gotta really keep my. Cool. I gotta keep my sources. Uh, <laughs> there may be a leak. There may be a leak. Is all I can say. We know it was. We we know it was neither one of you guys. We know it was neither one of you. By yeah. you know, Bear didn't even know I was putting that question. I know. In like I was like, what? What's this about? <laughs> I love the idea though. So, I, I saw the gun fitted in your dad's office. So, well, that's Just, actually something that we dabbled with probably four or five years ago. Was potentially doing a collaboration with Glenn Fittich 
Um, and it went out in the marketplace for, you know, trade, trademark purposes, all that kind of stuff. But as far as I know, that's as far as it went. And nothing has come up really mm-hmm. since, except I heard a little bit of talk about it potentially this week. But I don't know if it's a, necessarily a real thing or not. Just when you hear any news, Coop, just let me know so I can oh, get an update oh, okay. on what's going on with an Alec Bradley. You've been okay. Two weeks. Okay. All right. So it's not an Alec and Bradley collaboration then. This is something. No, definitely not. Uh, okay. If it was, I might have told him about it. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Bear, anything we want to hit on industry topics as well? We'll get into the live true otherwise. I'm good. All right. So uh, let's kind of uh, – just one more word from our sponsors. Uh, Luzioni Cigar, deep in flavor, deep in your mind. We are not industry standard. Luzioni Cigars. So now we're going to get into our – Alec Bradley uh, Live True segment. Um, and this is kind of what we do on the Thursday show, but g- given that you guys do the Live True segment on the, you know, we don't, we don't do this on the Tuesday show, but since you guys are here and you do the Live True segment for us on Thursday, we, we moved it over to, to Tuesdays here. And you know, this is kind of where we take a break from the hardcore cigar talk and we talk about things not related to cigars. I remember last time we had a very lively discussion about air travel. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, which uh, I still it, it, that started a little bit of a phenomenon after that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the whole coop tracker thing actually came exactly. after that. Which so I thank you guys for that because the day before IPCBR, I can say that the hashtag coop tracker was beating out the hashtag IPCBR nineteen. I can I, I actually so yeah I actually was try that's how it caught on. So uh, coop. What is it? Shoes of IPCBR hashtag. What was that? Shoes of IPCBR hashtag. Yes, and we we have something with that coming up, right, Bear? I think with that. Yes. Yeah, we have. So can we hold that thought? Yes. Yeah, we do have something related to that. Yes, in this exit. All right. So uh, yeah, so this is a little different. This is more of a rapid fire type of questioning we're going to do tonight uh, that could generate some pretty good conversation along the way. Uh, and we have like 15 rapid fire quite, they don't have to be rapid. We don't have to go quick. We can spend as much time or as little time as you want on it. Um, and we want to do is want to get to know you guys a little better. We kind of did this with your dad. Some of these questions we asked your dad and some of these we didn't. Um, so we'll kind of go through and, uh, hit some of these. So, um, I'll start it off and you guys each answer these, um, favorite a little bit, your volume went down for whatever reason. Okay. Hang on. Uh, how's that? Better? Nope. Uh, how's that? Bear talk? Um, um, how's my volume? Uh, it must be my phone or something. That's weird. My, my volume's all the way up, but my volume just happened to go down. Can you hear us now? Can you hear oh. us at all? We may have, we may be hitting the technical difficulties again. And now I don't hear them at all. Yeah, they're, and their screen froze up, too. They're so. freezing up. So, yeah, so they're probably hitting a little bit of a glitch there. Uh, Bear, back to the SS. Did you notice the change that they talked about? Yes, yes. Very I, much get, so. I, got a little, I get this, like, nutty flavor that comes in the second half with this. That kind of uh, – a little bit of a creamy, nutty flavor that mixes in. The spices definitely go down with this. Yes, definitely so, but it's still lingering on the lips a little bit. Um, but, yeah, that spice level has definitely decreased quite a bit. Um, yeah. This is this is a really enjoyable cigar. It, it, it's, I, a, it's a it's a fun cigar to smoke. It's a good cigar, um, is what I'll say. And well, I kind of put it in that same wheelhouse as like you know KFC, you know Kentucky Fire Cured. You know it's it's a polarizing cigar, but it, when you, it hits the spot when you need that, when you crave that, when you need that, it's a, it's the perfect cigar to smoke. So, and this this could definitely fit that fit that kind of mantra a little bit, man. I'm I'm really I'm really enjoying it. I'm not just saying it for the benefit and No, no, I our, I, I our guests are gone, so I could I could totally dog it right now if I wanted to, but no, I am really enjoying this. They're kind of trying to get back in, it looks like. I see them uh logged back in. Uh we got the blank screen uh there. So we'll give them a minute. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is I really got the pepper on the tongue this time, which I hadn't got I got it, but this time it was like really pronounced on the on not the tongue, the lip. Um and uh so that one I definitely got it a lot more. But yeah, you nailed it with that watermelon flavor. That was uh I think we're getting them back here. So uh very nostalgic for me, man. It's boy, we, these guys these guys are going over above and beyond here, so we really appreciate it. Uh apologize. You're yeah. back, can you hear us? Yeah. 
Uh, I charged my phone right before I came, and it still managed to die. Okay. So we're back. Okay. Man, you guys are awesome. No. He, well, this has been interesting, mate, huh? No. <laughs> these, like guys, I said, these, these guys are troopers, man. Look at this. This is awesome. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. Oh, uh, no. Please, we're happy. We're happy to be here. We just, want, we just feel bad that it's been getting messed up. No, it's not that bad at all. Uh, we've had worse. Because the sound's okay. We're just losing you for a, a minute or two, like, but the sound's good and the video's pretty good, so uh, it, it's fine. Perfect. Uh, the worst thing is when we lose the sound on the guest end. There's nothing worse. That's the worst because we get so many people listen to the show. Um, so that's always the, the number one thing if that goes. Um, and uh, this is newer technology we're using too here. Because last time we weren't streaming on Facebook like we are now. All right. Well, we're back now. Okay. So we got these questions. Um, and I'll start the first one off. And it's uh, your favorite movie that you could watch over and over and over again. Uh, the Big Lebowski. Good one. Yeah, I might second that one. I don't, not to the be dude. unoriginal, but that's, that's – I definitely saw it before you, so you can't point at me like that. It doesn't matter. I answered first. Um, that's a hard one to beat. That's a great movie. I got totally hooked on Kahlua after that movie. White Russians after that. Everyone does. Everyone does. I had my first one after that movie, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was. Uh, and I saw that movie like a few years after it came out. I didn't see it in the movie, but it was one of those folklore movies that I finally saw. And I'm like, wow, this is a great movie. And yeah. sometimes it gets overlooked when you talk about movies like that. I agree. And the second one's coming out. No. Yeah. No. 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 no, they're not making a second one. No, they did all those commercials where everyone thought they were making a second one, but was, I thought they were. It was really just a Stella commercial for the Super Bowl or something like that. Oh wow, that's what too bad, that? man. That was kind of exciting. Yeah. Best oh wow, I'll be. I, you gave my hopes up there for a minute. I know. That's, uh, what, the, that's what I was told. The dude abides. Yes. Yep. Yep. All right. So we got a couple of big you guys are both in sync with that one. All right. Let's see what this one now. Uh, your favorite band. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a, that's, that's a hard one. Your, your, your dad was partial to some hip hop, man. That caught me off guard. He we were so some... some... Yeah. Well, I usually listen to like, like disco and funk. Yes. So like, I'm, I'm, that's what I've been on for like the past, I don't know, year and a half, two years. Um, but if you're talking about just like, Nostalgic band for me growing up was ACDC. Was jeez, you're freaking that was the best killing concert. me right that's now. That's best, a, that's best, exactly what I was thinking. The best concert I've ever seen in my life. Oh, you went to that one too? The Black the Black Ice tour. That was I, fantastic. I don't remember how old I was, but I Here listened to a lot of ACDC, and I was just excited that they had come out with a, a new album while I was still, you know, in that era. Yeah, for me, uh, Foo Fighters is definitely a, a band that I absolutely love, and seeing them in concert was insane also at a pretty young age so so you guys uh brad you mentioned the funk and and disco a little bit and acdc certainly isn't terribly contemporary but is there is there an older oldies band that you guys are into like say like 60s 70s maybe even 50s i mean on your ipod i mean something i got those things like the average white band like somewhat recently and uh I don't know. There's, there's just, I'm more focused on different songs that I just hear and I fall in love with. And then maybe I'll get into the artist, but um, yeah, right now the average white band is, is someone I've been listening to quite a bit. I, I even like old jazz. I think Brad does as well. If you know, some nice Nina Simone or something like that is always good to put on as well. I want to go back to that ACDC for a second. Bon Scott or Brian Johnston? Brian Johnston. But our question, Brian Johnson, I agree. I'm happy that you agree. You, you, you know, <laughs> I'll I don't date know what's my. What's going to happen if, if you didn't agree? No, I don't know. I mean, you, Bon Scott, nothing against him either. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, not, not, you know, yeah, the Axl Rose thing, I kind of would have questioned to be honest, because you know, he's been filling it. He was filling in for a while for Brian Johnson. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, again, I'll date myself in age. Uh, the, you know, the song that he had, Big Balls. You remember? I, it's, I, I, I don't remember that song personally. Well, you go listen to it. It's an old ACDC song, and it came out when I was in junior high school. So okay. you can picture a whole bunch of junior high school boys just singing that song. Yeah. 
it's like, <laughs> and it's exact. And it's ex- you got to go listen to the song to say that. Like I said, that's a, that's a that's old ACDC there. Okay. My dad yeah. is now trolling me, and he said, "President of the United States of America." Wow. I mean, he's got some real eclectic taste, Alan. Yeah. Wow, that's a band I completely forgot about. Yeah, I remember. Got some- like both my parents went to University of Florida, so we would go up to uh, Gator, oh, yeah. Gator Games quite a bit. And uh, at their homecoming show, Gator Growl, it was a Steve Miller band. That was awesome. And so after that, like awesome I was show. pretty young, but they were they're amazing. And Rush also big one up there. Well, I've seen Rush a lot. Yeah, yeah. I've seen Rush once. Yeah, twice. I've seen I've seen them a lot, and it's a real. They're they're. I've seen them. I mean, going, the first time I saw him was in the 80s, so, uh, and I saw him all the way up to the 40th anniversary tour, so. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm also a big Styx fan. Styx is Dennis and Young, yeah. yeah. Tommy Show. I'm definitely uh, Styx over Kiss, I'm not going to lie. I am too. I am too. Man, Coop, Alan Rubin's giving you running for your money on being a renaissance man and a music savant. Oh, he so. is. He is definitely. I mean, he's got a – I mean, he was talking about 50 Cent and stuff like that. Uh, I know, man. Dropping some hip-hop, dude. It's awesome. Right. right. He'll, pull, he'll pull some, like, Black Street every once in a while. You, you never know with him. Right. It, it's kind of interesting because, you know, my boys, they, they, uh, they're all over the place, too, with their music, too. It's kind of interesting, more so than me, maybe, just because they like the newer stuff, which I'm not really into a, a bunch of the newer bands. Yeah, my girlfriend has me listening to a lot of Amy Winehouse right now. I'm listening to to her quite a bit. Well, yeah, I mean that's just good music. Incredible, incredible voice, man. Yeah, tragic, incredible. tragic, tragic. Yeah. Yes, too yeah. bad. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, a lot of people looking at her as you know, yeah, megastar coming up. Yeah, the talented ones die young, man. It's yep. it sucks. Yeah, you know. Y- y- yeah, I mean, you mentioned what was the best concert you guys went? To? I mean, you guys mentioned a couple. Are there any other good concerts you guys went to? ACDC was definitely up there for one of the best concerts I've ever been to. I went to the uh, Jay-Z Justin Timberlake concert, and that was absolutely insane. Yeah. I'll say the worst concert I've ever been to was Van Halen. Really? Now, which Van Halen? Because I've seen both iterations of Van Halen. I don't know if it was the speakers. The speakers were bad. I don't know if Eddie Van Halen was just wasted on his guitar solo. Probably the case. (laughs) It could have been both. But it was just not a good concert. Doesn't matter if it was there was a problem with the speakers, the sound or the the band itself. Uh, but just not a good show. We went to a, a decent amount of concerts growing up. We were really lucky in that in that way. So we got to see a lot of people that we we were exposed to a lot of good music from a young age. You and mentioned at, yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Yeah, and at that that same arena was uh, was where the Florida Panthers play. So that's where I found my love for hockey as well. Oh, you're a Florida Panthers fan? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> got, how did you guys let that coach go to Vegas? I know. I how know. Did, but you got you got Coach Q. Yeah, but it was it was you know inside office stuff. It was you know people disagreeing about stuff. He was only what twenty games in this, into the season. We were like ten and ten or whatever it was, and we just like let him go because he they weren't agreeing um, inside the office, and then goes to Vegas as well as Jonathan Marcheseau and a couple other guys and first season Stanley Cup. Yeah, I mean, uh, what a run that was. I mean, I'm a Flyers fan. We were really hoping to get Coach Q. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. love the guy we got. You know, Bear, you talk about I got these bad coaches. Uh, Elaine Vigneault, he's going to be a great coach for the Flyers. I love his philosophy and yeah. everything. Yeah, I mean, Coach Q and then Dale Town, who also came from the Blackhawks. Yeah. Um, you know, they made the they made Chicago what it was, um, with Patrick Kane and Taves and that that run that they had for years. So hopefully they can recreate that down in South Florida. Did you see that 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 the one series I always loved in the NHL uh, was the 2011 Stanley Cup? Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was the 2013 Stanley Cup with the Blackhawks and the Bruins. And I remember you know the Blackhawks won it in Boston, and the Boston fans just really say what you want about Boston fans. With you know they obviously they have a take it a lot. But no, say what you want. They were great sports when, because uh, w- that was such a great. It was a six-game series, and they were just, they lost, but they really appreciated what the Blackhawks brought, brought that year. Coop, you could say the same thing about Philly fans. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, well, Super Bowl. Yeah, class act. Yeah, they were Philly. Yeah, they were. Um, you know, I can say that too. When um, 
you know, I, when the, I'm a Giants fan, and I mean, when we had the two runs uh, with Coughlin, um, the um, the fans were behind us that year. The, the Eagle fans really got behind us that year, which I was surprised. Oh, uh, oh, at least, I don't say all of them, but there were a lot that did. Are you a Daniel Jones fan? Uh, I'm an Eli fan. Okay. Oh, uh, look, Eli won two Super Bowls. I don't put He's a lot. Still dissolution, Brad. But, it's okay. But here's the thing. <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, Daniel Jones is, is a New York Giant now, um, and if he wins the job, he'll have my full support. I thought the pick was horrendous. Okay, that's what. Not I, obviously, Eli should still get the start. But I was curious if you supported the pick. Uh, I didn't support the pick when it was made because no. basically it was it was he was picked too high, and oh, basically yeah. you're kind of you made a commitment to Eli, but now you you, you pick a guy at six, you got to play him. I mean, didn't they have another top or another first round pick, like 15, 16? Yep. Mm-hmm. So they could have yeah. just drafted him there. Like, they I, don't could. Think, I don't think anyone was worried about him falling or not. They could have drafted him in the second round. Yeah, whatever it was. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I was, hear, I was hearing good. I'm not a big college football guy, but the intel I heard on Daniel Jones was positive, but no one had him top 10. Yeah. And you can't put, like, here's the thing. You can't put him playing against these defenses right now and make any sort of um, no. any sort of conclusion. I would be surprised if they benched Eli. I think you you're better off starting Eli and let him just fall out of the job in the regular season than than to throw Jones into the fire. Here's the thing: there's no one who's going to pass protect Eli quarterback right now. <laughs> so I don't. I, you can put Tom Brady back there, and it's not going to be good. Yeah. I mean, the, the Dolphins have uh, Fitzpatrick, and then they went out and got Rosen. And I don't think Rosen's our guy, but we didn't give up too much for him, which usually the Dolphins like to, you know, trade away players for nothing. And when they, if they ever do trade for a player, usually give away way too much. Um, so luckily we didn't do that. But I don't think he's our guy. Everyone was saying tank for Tua. I don't think Tua's the guy either, but, you know, what do I know? No, um, the the concern I have is you hired a coach with no experience. He had very little experience as a coordinator. Um, I know you got him from the Patriots, but Brian yeah. Flores didn't have – like this was the problem the Giants had when they brought in McAdoo. I think you got to have several years as a coordinator before you go into a head coaching job. Yeah, I mean, Gase had some experience. Before that, Feldman had some experience. But geez, they are both robots, so – at least Brian Brian Flores seems like a human being. So yeah, so. yeah, that's true. You know, it's interesting because Gaze. Um, I listen to a lot of New York sports radio and Philly sports radio, obviously because I have teams up there. Um, and I mean, I just remember when there was a couple of guys up there saying, "I have this bad feeling we're gonna get Adam Gaze for like weeks." <laughs> this one guy, Joe Beningo, is he's a Jets fan on the radio, and and his worst, he he was like. So horrified that they he was on vacation when Gaze got hired and they called him up and he just ranted on the thing. Uh, well, that's the thing about the AFC East. We like to trade around our coaches and players a lot. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, Is, what's your favorite sports, actually? What's uh, the football, hockey? Uh, watching live hockey is number one. Uh, favorite yes! Sport. Favorite sport is football, but – I, I refuse to drive an hour to watch the Dolphins lose, so I'd rather watch every game at home, see how my fantasy team is doing. And then um, basketball, just the Heat are the only good team that I've had in my lifetime uh, down in South Florida. So, Marlins. Uh, well, and the Marlins when Marlins. they won the Super Bowl and, or Super Bowl, wow, sorry, World Series. Uh, and uh, what was that? 03, 04? 97 and 03. Uh, 97 and 03. Yeah. Do you, do you know what the Marlins claim to fame is in baseball history? What's that? Only undefeated team in the playoffs. Really? They've never lost a playoff series. Dolphins, only undefeated team. Well, for the regular season. No. For the whole season. They, they won the, yeah, they won the Super Bowl that year. That's true. So I'm still holding, I'm talking about the Marino years. No, no, I'm still holding on to that. That's the only way I could talk over a Patriots fan, so. Very good, and uh, no, that's that's interesting. Um, do you, we have to get you for a hockey show with Dojo, me, you, and Dojo yeah. once. We yeah. have a, we'll have to do a hockey show. I we have trouble. My, my co-hosts are not hockey guys, so yeah, I'm actually excited for the season. I am too. I, I, I because I'm not looking forward to football season right now, so I'm just <laughs> yeah. fast forwarding to to basketball and hockey right now for the sixes yeah. and five. 
Yeah, Luongo retired, and then we got um. Uh, why am I blanking on the goalie's name? Um, fuck. Can't remember his name. Whatever. But I think he came from the Blue Jackets. Guy's a superstar. Big year for the Panthers. As you can tell, sports is not my thing. I'm letting Brad take this part over. Yeah. That's okay. There's no problem at all. All right. Let's. These are a couple of questions that uh, you'll appreciate, Alec, um, when you watch the second half of that last week's show. Okay. All right. The first thing I'm going to ask is, your, what is your favorite type of deli meat, guys? Oh, easy. Ham for me. Oh, pastrami. Easy. Pastrami. Oh, you guys brought some killer pastrami in that day in the office. Oh, yeah. Pastrami all day. How about some, you? Great, some great deli meat at that press event that you guys hosted for us, too, in Vegas, man. That's the, that, that was awesome. Yeah. Did you get to try everything that we had that night? I, I did my I did my darndest to try for sure. Yeah, Chef Nicole was there serving up some pretty pretty good food. So, oh yeah, that was that was top notch. But the deli meat you guys brought into the office that day was like where were we bringing it from? I don't remember. It was unbelievable. I mean, it was corned beef in there, pastrami. The pastrami was was killer. I can't remember. Uh, but I'm a big mortadella fan, so if you can, someone can rock a mortadella. That's awesome with the pistachios yeah. in it. It's good stuff. Very good. Wait, wait. Uh, have you guys ever had Lebanon bologna? No. Uh, you gotta try it. This okay. that, that uh, it, it's uh, it's we it's have people. salami coop. It's not no, bologna. It, it's bologna. <laughs> it's it's it, here's the thing. It's like a hybrid, but it's got this smoky taste to it. Uh, the boar's head cut is the best cut. Is what I'll say. Okay, I'll take a look for it. What is it again? Lebanon bologna. Okay, I'll take a look. Yep, the deli counter will probably have it. Yeah. Yeah, it because. They sell it in the supermarkets. It's it's a bigger thing in the South right now. Okay. So, so yeah, um, yeah. We're in South but, Florida, but that's not considered the South. So. Right. That's what. But 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 I think you guys have enough of a. If chance off, you got some of the deli meat you guys brought in. They'll have it there. It, yeah, but it's it, but it's more popular in like this area. You know, from the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, definitely, it's it's not it's not your Oscar Maya bologna is what I'll say. Like Bear said, it had it looks like salami. Okay. But it's uh, it doesn't taste like salami. Fair enough. Yeah. Take it up. Yeah. All right. Now here's a really this is the other one. What is your favorite fast food sandwich? Uh, I'm a Wendy's chicken Asiago. Yes. Uh, yeah, big Wendy's guy, chocolate frosties, all day. Oh, I'm a Shake Shack guy. <laughs> All day. Four I'll bucks, you can't it. beat it. What was that? Four bucks, you can't beat it. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, but, but Shake Shack's like premium fast food. Yeah. I will drive for Shake Shack, okay? Like, do they, I don't think they don't have – they don't have drive throughs at Shake Shack, do they? No. No. Really. Yeah, we had some debate if that qualifies as fast food. I think we concluded it does. If you don't have a drive-in, is it fast food? What? That was, a, that was a debate on last week's show, actually. Because the debate came up about is Five Guys fast food. Yeah, no, Five Guys. Five no. Guys isn't fast food. No, I think it is. No, fast food is. I fast. love me some fast. Fast guys. food is fast because you drive, you drive, you go through the drive thru and you pick it up. Fine. So In and Out. Okay. In In and Out has a drive thru. So. Yep. So yeah. I've actually ne- I've I've actually never had Shake Shack, but I hear it's amazing. So. It's much better than in and out I'd say that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, it's under, yeah I got to get some when I'm down in Florida next time, actually. Yeah. You have some up by you, some Shake Shack also. You have to. We have Steak and Shake, yeah. Can we also talk about how Charlotte Airport's like the best airport? I know, I think we did. Yes, we, we, we did. The, yes, we talked about that last time. Because uh, I, I flew back in there this past week, and it's the it's the. It's a great airport. It's, they have everything. And they're the like, bu- did you go there? It's great. I got some like biscuit mix while I was at the Charlotte airport last time I was there. It was, it was, it's pretty solid. They had good beer in the airport. Yeah, I mean, you guys have that Carolina barbecue place, which is in the food court. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, and have you, you got to go, you have to go to Bad Daddy's. Bad Daddy's. Okay. Bad Daddy's Burger Bar. I think last time I was there, I flew from Charleston, had a layover in Charlotte. At home, but I bought so much stuff in that airport. It was ridiculous. And someone, my my friend, told me that the they have the best shoe shines there. And yeah, the problem is every time I go there. In fact, I have to go get. I'm I'm flying tomorrow to New York, 
and um, I have to go get a shoe shines there. Yeah. Although I'm screwed. Yeah, you just wait until you go to the airport to get your shoe shines. What is the worst airport that you've ever been to? Newark. Really? Hands down, it's the worst airport I've ever been to. Not O'Hare. O'Hare's like a freaking maze, man. Yeah, uh, O'Hare, uh, LaGuardia, MIA. Oh my I, god, I hate Miami. I hate. hate- I hate MIA. You get a workout in Miami though, because when you leave the gate, it's like ten miles to the to the to the to the exit. Same exactly. with O'Hare, especially international takes forever out of Miami. The the problem with Newark is here's what I'll say is don't don't do an international changeover in Newark. I'm flying into Newark next month. Are you going international? No. Okay. The problem is with international is you have to go through security again. Really? Yes. That makes no sense. It makes well, yeah. It, it's they, they, you know, they don't have it set up where you don't have to do that. Most airports do. Yeah. And uh, when I went to Sweden, I learned that the hard way. Yeah. Laguardia uh, has a lounge that you you have to you can go to the lounge before you go through security, but after security, you cannot go to the lounge, which makes zero sense. Yes, uh, and, and Laguardia right now, uh, I'm flying into JFK tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And um, I purposely avoided LaGuardia because they are completely like renovating that airport. It is under yeah, the major. Delta, con- the Delta section is great. Everything else needs to be renovated. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Those it looks like the old buildings look run down. There's actually a lot of history with that. Um, it's just they let it go. I wish they would have kept the old. They, they would keep the old charm to it, but that's not the case. No. And every single time I, I fly out of MIA, my gate gets changed about 27 times before I find out where my actual gate is. Yep. I'll tell you one airport I like is the Vegas airport. That's an easy airport. Yeah. yeah. It's an easy airport, and I have a routine. Like, when I go to Vegas, I don't gamble on the casinos, but uh, I go into one of those uh, smoking areas. The little boxes? The little boxes, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I'll get there a couple hours early, and I'll, I'll – I'll, put money in the slot machines and milk it while I'm smoking cigars. Nice. So it's kind of a, it, 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 it always, uh, it always kills the time very quickly. It seems like I could get there two hours early and I'm like, man, I got to get on the plane now. That's awesome. Man. Yeah. But they won't let you sit and loiter there. So you have to gamble. Uh, so, I know, you know, I, I sit in there and I loiter. I do. It depends. They yelled at me. I think they yelled at me once. I walked out and just walked back in. So you can't, <laughs> just, you can't just smoke in there? There's no. You can. They don't check that often. I mean, if it's empty, they're not going to bother you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, that's, you know, but, but I figured, well, I, I could sit. Uh, and uh, they just they just increased the prices of the slot machines in there, too. I mean, I used to be able to use the quarter ones. Now everything is like 50 cents in there. The nice thing about the Vegas airport is if you fly on off days, like we normally do for the trade show, it's not busy. If you're not flying out on a Sunday, you're okay. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's true. Uh, usually, like, and I've I've stopped taking red eyes out of that airport too. It's just no more red eyes for me. I always take the, we always take the red eye every single time. Yeah, the red eyes just are brutal on me right now because I can't sleep on the plane. Is the problem? Really? Yeah, I have trouble sleeping on the plane. How young were you guys when you guys first went to Vegas? First time. Um, for work or just in general? First time we went, we, I was thirteen, so you were ten. Yeah, something like that. We actually we went because they, of IPCPR, so we did a little family vacation. Uh, so our mom took us around and all that stuff, and we actually got to go into the trade show for just a little bit before we got kicked out. See what everything's about, and just take a little sneak peek. Uh, see see what it is that that our father did at the time. One of my things that kind of blows my mind the last couple of years in Vegas is like the, the amount of families that are there. And then it's like two o'clock when we got out of the Alec Bradley press party, it was like, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning or whatever. And there's like, you were there later than I was par- parents rolling around with their ke- like their infants and in strollers and stuff. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Yeah. It's not, it's not a family place. Like you can do some family stuff, but it won't last. You, you can't do that trip twice. Yeah, there's like aquariums yeah. and like all that kind of, you can go see shows or whatever. Yeah. But. but then, you know, your kid gets an alcoholic beverage and then starts partying. <laughs> and next thing you know, they're at a strip club. So, you know, when you're 10 years old, <laughs> that the stuff doesn't always fly. 
<laughs> I went to Vegas for the first time. I was 28. So I was older when I went. Um, I did go on a father son trip to Vegas uh, shortly after that. And the funny thing is we're walking through the casinos, right? And all these young girls are smiling at my dad. And my dad thinks they're all trying to, like, hit on him, right? Um, and I'm like, Dad, they're pros. He's like, no, they're not. They're really into me. I said, Dad, they're pros. He goes, how do you know that? I said, well, look at that girl. She's pretending to be on her cell phone, but there's no – she's not really on her cell phone. And he's like – he goes, shit, you're right. I'm like, yeah, because they basically – that's what they do to prevent themselves from loitering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's really funny. Yeah. yeah. What was but, the first uh, thing? That you were there for a work trip, right? Was it, it was, uh, yeah, when I was working for IBM, we had our conference there. Yeah. So uh, that's what it was. We Every year we had our soft, We So I, I've been going every year since 2003 for either my, when I was with IBM or, or for IPCPR. I've gone every year since 2003. Wow. I've and, missed one year since I was 18, I think. Yeah. Well, a couple, and I had a couple personal trips in there too. I, I can't handle the personal side of Vegas anymore. It's just, I've gotten too old for that. But the best thing is, uh, I went to that, you know, you talked about the fam. Like, remember, it was a time that late 90s, they were trying to make Vegas family friendly. They, so they opened up Circus Circus. Treasure yeah. Island, Circus Circus. Yeah. yeah I went to Circus. They need to tear down Circus Circus. New York, New York. Yeah. Yeah. Circus Circus, I went there and it was like going to Chuck E. Cheese with, with slot machines. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. I mean, this is hard. I mean, wow. And it was, this is like 2004, 2005, and it was run down then. And it's still there. Apparently, that's where all the locals go. It's the Circus Circus. Yeah. Now, when I was out in Vegas this year, uh, I went a couple of days to the mountains. I went up to Mount Charleston. Mm -hmm. uh, a very remote, isolated area is what I'll just say. A uh, great resort I stayed up there for, for three days, just kind of chilling before IPCBR. Uh, I loved it so much, I booked it for the next year again. Where did you stay for IPCBR? Oh, the media house. Oh, the media house. We got to get you guys out to the media house next year. The party house. The party house. The party house. You know, it wasn't a crazy party, though. That was the thing. Like, we didn't have people getting, like, Bellity showed up a little hammered, right? But he was already hammered when he got there. But it wasn't like people were getting, like, trashed or anything. But people were there late. Like, like yeah. there were guys there until 6 a.m. Talking tobacco. I had gone, to, gone to bed way before that. Yeah, yeah. me too. But uh, Surgeon was up with Skip Martin at six in the morning, and they're they're still talking about tobacco. That sounds like a Ralph thing. Yeah, that's just, yep. that's that's a late night. Yeah, yeah. I know tobacco is interesting, but till six in the morning. No, it's what well, I mean, and and uh, I was exo I was falling asleep outside at like three a.m. and. I got nervous, right? Because I thought I was getting sick again. Like, like that's what happened when I got the blood infection. I was getting drowsy. So yeah. when I, when I kind of got woke up, I ran inside and I took my, my temperature, right? Cause I was worried I was getting the blood infection again and my temperature was fine. Like, so put it, but that's that was how, right. IPCPR was right after all that stuff happened, right? That was like, right. Where, it happened right after I visited you guys in November. Yeah. yeah I was we're actually, not yeah. Going to it. Yeah. yeah, and it was uh, I was ignoring all the signs, and then by Thanksgiving I was in the hospital. To, Jeez. Yeah, I did. The, I did a podcast. Like, what was it? The, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Yeah. And, and uh, I basically how I got through that podcast. I I look at the video of that podcast, and I didn't. And I look at the video, a few of the videos I did even after I came back, and I I didn't. I look sick. It was amazing. I I, I look at the video. It's a big difference. Yeah. But uh. But no, it was uh yeah. That's when it all it, when I got back from Florida from that uh that's when it all started. So, but uh now I'm feeling good now. So, good. all right. So, so Coop, I wanted to ask my question. Okay. So we were, we kind of alluded to it earlier, guys, about uh, about your shoe game, and uh, the hashtag shoes of IPCPR kind of kind of takes over. Year, uh, years past and everything. So, uh, Coop and I last year's IPCPR, not this, uh, not last month, but uh, last year's IP, uh, IPCPR, we were sitting down with uh, Bill Paley of La Polina, yeah. and uh, Bill's uh, relaxing with this, and he's. Uh, I, I noticed after this transpired, the comfortable shoes he was that he was that he was wearing, and apparently that's like his staple. But your your dad was so proud of the comfortable shoes that he was wearing that day is that he he came into the booth and. He shouted from half 
halfway across the booth. Hey, Bill, I, you know, I've got you guys, I got you one up and he showed off, I guess, these, these, these really <laughs> comfortable loafers that he had. So what, yeah. what is, uh, what are Bradley and Alex shoe game? Like what's your favorite pair of shoes? What do you guys like to rock? On a day to day for me, I rock Adidas because I have the flattest feet in the world and they're super comfortable. I basically, my feet are basically two by fours with toes. So yeah, exactly. So I rock, I, Day to day, I, I wear Adidas, but when I'm working, when I'm traveling, it's either uh, Allen Edmonds or Ferragamo's for sure. Oh wow! They're, well, they're the only ones that make a triple a triple E in the width, and my feet are flat, but they're also insanely wide. So I, I get either a double or a triple E in the width, which is one of the largest in the width, and that that really uh, that really helps a lot. But also, fantastic looking shoes. Yeah, I'm usually uh, what is it? Uh, Ted, uh, Ted, Baker. Ted Baker and Cole Hans. Absolutely. But that's usually like trade show or work and then uh, usually either Adidas or Vans on the day to day. Bear, we, actually I know we covered this when we had them on last time, Alec and Browley. There used to be, you guys used to distribute something called Dr. RH. Yeah. And you guys had a shoe shine booth, I think, uh, one year at IPCBR. Mm -hmm. I remember I got my shoe shine there. Yeah, that was before that was before my time, also. I think this is like 2010. I think this was New Orleans. Uh, I distinctly remember getting the shoe shine there. We always like to do something a little bit different. This year, we almost had a barber at IPCBR, and that ended up not happening. But we were going to have a barber in the Alec and Bradley section of uh, of our booth. That ended up falling through, not happening. We were going to have our barber fly out for IBCPR this year, but um, we thought that that would have been a pretty cool idea. People get their hair cut while they're waiting for their appointment. I like that. I like that. Like an old school barber or just a regular barber? Yeah, just a regular barber. Like one of my one of my friends also smokes cigars, and that's kind of how we became friends. So, um, you know, it didn't end up happening, but, you know, what – a better way, you know, look clean and, and good for IPCPR, get your beard trimmed up there, you know, always good to have your beard line looking good. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I know you're on that game and I am too. So you always gotta, always gotta have the beard and, and the hair, you know, looking good. We gotta, we gotta talk to your brother, man. He needs to, he needs to get that filled in a little bit. Up. I can do it. Can do it. I just choose not to because when I get to that itchy point, I shave it every single time there's a threshold man you got to fight through it you got to fight through it and it'll be the best feeling in your life i'm telling I've, you i've never broken through it i yeah. promise you that it's like a, two weeks for me and during those two weeks i break it every time but i I'll, i will say when i have a, a little fade going i do take a straight razor to it every single day yeah nice. just to clean it up nice, nice and clean straight razor yeah and, oh, I, yeah. I, and I, I i got an unfortunate story on my beard um, <laughs> it was let's see I, think I, was in college. College. I was in college it was probably 2015 panthers have finally made the playoffs again first series they're playing the islanders so i'm like i'm gonna grow up my beard for the playoffs you know just let it ride and some really bad missed calls on the rest we lose the series obviously and i go to trim my beard and the guard falls off midway while i'm under my beard and just put a big fat line ah. right into it. So uh, and I'm I'm pretty like it's it's a pretty emotional thing. Bear, I think you agree that you know it's just part of who you are. And mm -hmm. uh, and then from then on, I was like, you know, I can either just do without the neck beard and do just you know just from the chin and up. But I was like, you know what, this is the time. Rock the mustache and let let the whole thing grow back. So I was a mustache guy for for two to three weeks. Why don't you tell everyone why you grew out your beard? Oh, and I grew out my beard in college uh, because I had Alex ID. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Alex had a little bit of stubble. Uh, so I was like, well, if I just grow out my beard, no one will know the difference. Uh, and that thing worked perfectly for me, except for two times. Um, but I managed to get that ID back. So it was, it, it worked great. Nice. Bradley literally grew out his beard for that reason and has lived with it ever since. Yeah, except for the playoffs. Except for when he accidentally shaved part of it off. Yeah. 
I've I've had a beard longer than I was ever clean shaven, and my mother to this day still asks me to shave. Like she's gonna probably catch the replay of this show and be like, you know that nice Alec? He was so clean shaven and nice and wonderful and handsome. You Why should can't you shave. Like when are you gonna shave? Never. 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 With you on that. Barrier. You should just do it one day just to completely freak her out. Mm-mm. No, man. She'll, she will not she'll recognize you. One day is not worth it. My wife wouldn't time, recognize man. me. My wife wouldn't recognize me. My wife told me, my mother asked my asked me to shave for my wedding day. And my wife said, if you do that, I'm not walking down the aisle. So I was like, ah, so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Winning. My, da- my daughter's husband, um, yeah, she made him shave the beard. Yeah. Uh, uh, he looked like Yukon Cornelius from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> and then when he shaved it, he looked like Bobby Hill from King of the Hill. King of the Hill. Yeah, Bobby Hill. That's hilarious. Yeah, with a, red, a reddish hair, Bobby Hill. He's got red hair, my uh, son-in-law. That's an awesome show. Oh, I love that show. So I've been instructed through the chat to ask how you got the ID back, Brad. Oh, um, who asked that question? That was my father, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, being the good father that my dad is, he so happens to call me the next morning, and I believe that IPCPR was going to be in New Orleans the next year, or just coming up, or whatever it was. And he's like, You have an ID, right? And I'm like, well, I kind of got it taken away last night. And he's like, all right, get me the name of the bar and this and that, and we'll figure it out. And, you know, he yells at the guy, you know, you took my, my son's ID. He needs it to get around. Like, how do you just take someone's ID? Like it was actually mine. And he's like, you're going to have to go there and just figure it out. And I'm like, all right. And, you know, see the guy that took my ID and he's like, yeah, like, I, I know it wasn't you, like, on the ID, like, who was it? And I was like, oh, like, yeah, that, that's my brother, like, he went to school here, and blah, 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 and this and that, and he's like, oh, well, if you had just told me it was your brother, I would have given your ID right back. And I'm like, well, why would I tell you that it was my brother if I'm using it as my ID? That makes zero sense. You would have taken it away anyways, and he goes to his truck and takes me there and pulls out a, you know, huge stack of IDs and just hands it to me. And I was considering, like, you know, a little exchange. Maybe I'd just, you know, help him out for giving my ID back. But I was like, you shouldn't have taken away in the first place. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it was so, actually his, like, my ID. Not, not no, yours. it was my ID. It was, so, it, my so, name was on So, it. yeah, my, my father got my ID back. But he called me the next morning asking just if I happened to have an ID. Because we were going, they were going to New Orleans for the trade. There's job. another funny story about that. Or I think it was New Orleans. With uh, Glenn Fiddick also. A lot of good stories. <laughs> so, guys, uh, I wanted to ask you too. This is something that kind of comes up in uh, with uh, the, the the culture that we live in now, and everything, and everything is text heavy, and we're we're all about sh- you know there are a lot of them. A lot of of these have been flying around the uh, the chat this uh, this evening. The emojis. What is your f- most frequently used emoji? I'm not a big emoji guy personally because I I'm still one that I, I still call a lot of people and most people are thrown off when I do but like no one likes to make phone calls anymore and that's that's the route I I tend to go. I like so, it. I like agree. Nice. This is an easy answer. The red AB. That's, that's a good answer. That's the best emoji out there. How do you get know. that? How do you get I that emoji? I don't know what it is, but it's awesome because it's our company. Red, red, Alec Bradley, got to use it on everything. I'm going to totally look for it right now. Yeah. <laughs> wow. it's, towards, it's towards the end. It's there. Wow. I can't remember. It was funny. I'm, I'm, my chat message seemed behind yours. I just saw your dad ask me about the story. Yeah. <laughs> the, the idea. So mine looks like it's true. And, then, I, and your dad just put a whole bunch of Alec Bradley. Oh, there it is. Red AB. Yeah. Wow. Nice. Start, start using it, guys. We're getting it going. <laughs> I think there's a crown also, which he also uses. Yeah, we're getting it going. Red AB. I love it. Whatever it is. I grab the post. AB emoji. We need a Lars emoji. There I'm are, sure there there's one enough, out there. There aren't enough. Oh, no, there is a Lars emoji. It's, the, it's just the smiley face with the cowboy hat. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's the Lars emoji. <laughs> and he uses that one, too. 
I bet. And this one. He uses yeah. those two. Yeah. Nice. Ours has his emojis. Nice. Go ahead, Bear. So, so kind of, I know we, we're kind of taking a break from tobacco, guys, but I do want to, I do want to know what your favorite, uh, what your favorite rapper tobacco is. Oh. oh, that's, that's an impossible question. Oh man, what, what's your favorite? I'm gonna throw that one right back at you because. Okay. That is a okay. Question. Um. You know that you're absolutely right. It is a hard, it is a hard question. Um, but I'd have to say that my favorite, my favorite rapper is probably uh, is probably Sumatran. Okay, Sumatran. I was gonna say for me, just because, you know, Blind Faith uses it and sure has, a, yeah. well, the Creole ninety eight um, is a big part of of what we do, and I think that's a characteristic that is noticed throughout our blends. So. Uh, for me, Creole 98 is, is definitely up dog. For me, you guys are going, you know, I just went on a strain, but really whatever is growing in either the Hopper Valley or in Trohes, because it runs through the same valley, I love using it as a rapper. Absolutely love using it. Um, something I, I want to get better at using for sure is uh, Pennsylvania Broadleaf as a rapper, because it's just so dominant of a, of a flavor profile. Just... Um, being able to balance out the flavor from that Pennsylvania broadleaf is something that I've had a lot of fun trying to just play with recently. And I did come up with a couple blends that I really like from it, but that's just, that's just what I really have been enjoying playing with myself. Pennsylvania broadleaf is fun and, but you're absolutely right. It's a really dominant profile. Mm -hmm. And if you can learn to kind of harness it and tame it and, partner and pair it really well and blend it really well it, it can make for a really good tobacco pennsylvania is a really great tobacco just uses even in filler as well i'd like to see someone use it as a binder uh as well i think that but i think combustion would become a really hard problem with the pennsylvania binder because it just does not it does not combust very well i was going to say it doesn't have the burn quality of a binder yeah it, mostly you know filler you can play with it as a wrapper but um, that would definitely be tough to play with as a binder. It would probably have to be a double binder with maybe some uh, Indonesian or something like that. You know, Ernesto's played with Connecticut broadleaf binders. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah I mean, I think the uh, I mean, the uh, New World Reserver, I think, uses a broadleaf binder. I think we were looking at Connecticut broadleaf as a potential for a uh, gatekeeper at one point and ended up straying away from it. It'd be interesting. Like, yeah, that has the same kind of characteristics. It doesn't burn well. You'd have to kind of pair it with something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but that it's, it, I mean, the world of tobacco is so great. You can kind of just, you can do a lot of interesting things, but it's, it's important that you can't, it, it's important to like, this is a great lesson in the fact that like when people are like, Oh, I like this tobacco and I like this tobacco, you should do this, this, and this. And it's like, well, you can't just throw this all together and then bam, something happens because yeah. Like we just talked about with Pennsylvania, it just doesn't have a combustion rate that a lot of other tobaccos do that, because the binder is so important. It's, it's, it's often overlooked. Most people talk about, obviously, wrapper dominates any conversation as it did with my question. Yeah. But then binder uh, and then filler guy kind of gets a lot of attention because you can put a lot of different st components in the filler. Binder gets overlooked a lot, but it is, it's, it's incredibly important. Yeah. Otherwise, the cigar yeah. doesn't burn well. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's why we, we – like Coop said before, that double binder is kind of one of our signatures because uh, it adds a little bit more complexity to the blend and more flavor. So just doing that can add a lot more to the cigar's performance overall. I, I'm a big Honduran tobacco guy. And because when, when Honduran tobacco is on, it's really good. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very polarizing to me because like, sometimes it could be very off. But um, I do really like, and I, I love what you guys did with that Magic Toast Maduro. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's a Honduran wrapper. When you can and, get some good Trojes or some good Hamastron that you're playing with in a, in a blend, it can really, it can really bring it together. Because I find that there's a certain sweetness that you can get from uh, Honduran tobacco that Nicaraguan doesn't always have. And it really brings out a certain characteristic in the cigar that I really enjoy. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry. And uh, I, I think for, for us, also at Alec Bradley, we have a little bit of a more personal connection with making cigars in, in Honduras and using Honduran tobacco. Um, you know, as you know, Prinsado being the only number one cigar to come out of Honduras, 
um, and just kind of the whole the whole community in Don Lee where where Rice is, uh, Cabanas is, and and helping them grow, and then them help, helping us grow. Uh, it's important for us to to make cigars that come out of Honduras, and so you know I've fallen in love with tobacco. Um, I think someone who's making great Honduran cigars is uh, is Oscar. Um, I I think he's do, really doing a good job uh, promoting Honduran tobacco. Um, and what it could really bring to the table as, you know, as well. So, uh, that's, that's kind of, you know, how, even, how, even those Aladinos are. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a pure, that's a pure Honduran. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Ga uh, Gabby Caffey also making really good stuff out of Honduras. So he breathes, um, he lives and breathes. Honduras. Yeah. He, he loves the Honduran tobacco. So there's, you know, everyone obviously always talks about Dominican and, <clears throat> Nicaraguan being those are the top two places where cigars were made, but we're we're pretty proud of of Honduras and what they bring to the table. And like I said, the Trojas wrapper, you guys really put that on the map. I mean, there's no question. I like probably put that wrapper on the map. You've used it on some amazing blends. I mean, uh, the Fine and Rare uses it, I believe, right? And yeah. and the uh, the Mondial. I mean, so you oh, guys, yeah. Have, you yeah, I mean. You guys have really put that on them, and of course the blind face, which I'm smoking right now. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful wrapper in terms of texture as well. Nice. That you guys seem to get with that, yeah. I mean, you look at this blind face; it's it's beautiful. The Mundial is overall my favorite, my favorite like overall brand that you got uh, that uh, Alec Bradley makes. But the uh, Brad and I were talking about the the Coil uh, T Lancero. Oh, I mean There's something about that Mundial number four, the number five. Mm -hmm. It's such a refined cigar. And for people that haven't tried it, I think when they do smoke it, it is a very different experience just because of how refined those flavors are. It's very, they're very, Mundial is very creamy. And that's yeah. something that's very unique. When you, can, when you think about Honduran tobacco, just in essence, cream is not a flavor profile that you, you get out of it. But Mundial coaxes out of it with the, the rest of the blend in, in a very, very pronounced way that just makes for a, just a tremendous cigar all around. I love every single Vitola. That that brand is is still one of my favorites, and that's one I gravitate to the smaller sizes in that blend. I found um, and normally, I, like I said, I kind of gravitate medium to larger ring, but that one I really like the the, the the smaller size. They just are real flavor bombs. Those things. Yeah, that was the first cigar to ever put me on my ass. It's a stronger cigar, yeah, and yeah. and that that Figurado, I love that shape of the Figurado as well. It's just it's a, it's. I wish there were more cigars like that in the market, but it. Again, kind of gives you guys a place uh, with something very unique as well. Yeah. All right, guys, settle a debate for Coop and I. It'll never be settled because it'll just constantly be a fight. <laughs> but we settle something for us. So I'm not going to tell you. We'll, we'll tell you afterwards after we hear your answers. But we're not going to tell you up front. If, but if you guys have watched the show, you probably know where we fall on this. The Tatuaje Monster Series. Oh. The longest running I get one of the longest running series that you could probably imagine and that, you know, is, uh, you know, kind of a, a regional or excuse me, a seasonal release rather yeah. uh, over the years is the Tatuaje monster series, a gimmick. No, absolutely not. In my opinion. No, I think it's a, like you said, it's a series. So he came up with something. It did well and he continued with it. It comes, you know, He's doing something different within the industry and in an industry that has very little innovation in the first place. He tried to do something different and it stuck and I commend him for that. And I definitely don't find that to be gimmicky. I see what you might say in terms of it being gimmicky, but for me, no, I think it's just a very smart series that he came up with and people have gravitated toward. Yeah. And I, I, I would also, Digging a little, I would say no as well because the cigars are fantastic. The Kruger, best one. Um, the most overlooked one. I think it's the most overlooked of the monsters. Yeah, the best one. I just bought brought a, a box, box of, of the brides of the dress the dress box of the brides. Yeah. So the Kruger, or sorry, the the monster series. Well, the packaging, if you want to say, could be a little gimmicky because it plays off of some of our favorite movies and stuff like that, that's okay. But the bands, as Pete does, are always simple. So, um, and the cigars, they don't, it's not like the cigars look, you know, gimmicky or whatever. So the cigars perform and that's really what matters. But gimmicky goes along with the same thing as like boutique, like what is a gimmick and what's not a gimmick. 
if a cigar looks gimmicky but is a, just a good cigar, is it still a gimmick? Yeah, I agree with that. If a cigar looks gimmicky and it's not good, then I might consider it a gimmick. But if it seems maybe on the cusp, but it's a great smoking cigar, I'm absolutely fine with it. Those are absolutely the right answers. It is not a gimmick. <laughs> Coop looked defeated. Coop Listen, defeated. all I know is that Pete Johnson agreed with me. It was gimmicky. Well, Pete, is, inter- Pete is wrong about his, his own cigars. cigars. No, he's not. It's, he said it. He, he said it a gimmicky. I answered. He said absolutely a gimmicky. He said. No. But no. he also said he made gimmicky cigars cool. So um, he said they're gimmicky. He didn't say it was a gimmick. Yes. A little gimmicky. Some ish. Some like gimmick-ish. Gimmick-ish. Oh, that's a technicality there. <laughs> technicality that works. That it's not a gimmick. Absolutely right answers, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good night. Good night. <laughs> by, by, by the way, the, the bride, if you guys haven't smoked the brides lately, uh, they have been aging really well, like in the last 10 months. Yeah. Uh, Why yeah, you smoking yeah. them if they're a gimmick, though, Coop? What are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't say I don't smoke gimmicky cigars. <laughs> Look, I saw a cigar today that came out. It's called a peanut butter cookie. That's all I'm going to tell you. That, 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 that's extremely gimmicky. Did you smoke it? No, I, I got I got I got an email on it. I'm not gonna a peanut butter cookie is all I'm saying. No. Yeah, like uh, I'm sure people would say our our filthy hooligan and shamrock is a gimmick, but I smoked the filthy hooligan on a, on oh a daily morning basis. Uh, actually, until we ran out, so that that ended. But I love filthy hooligan, and it might be a gimmick, but it smokes like a champ. Dude, um, gimmick, gimmicks don't work, so the filthy hooligan doesn't qualify as a gimmick. It's not would, a gimmick. It would you works. say? <laughs> would you say Texas Lancero was gimmicky? No, it was a play on words. It's just a big cigar. Yeah, it's a it's a good cigar. Actually, it's a very it's a, you know it was blended for that size. It's I yes, liked it. It was absolutely blended for that size. It's a play on words. It's a little tongue in cheek, and I don't really consider it a gimmick. It's just a large cigar with a funny name. I love the ads that your dad did for those for that cigar. Um, you know, he's, it was, I guess he was at a, a biker bar or whatever, and he's got all these guys like hell's angels all around yeah. and stuff. And he's sitting there lighting up this Texas Lancero. Awesome. Awesome marketing. Loved it. Yeah. And it, it was, was like, a, it was like, he was sitting on like a Honda thousand, like a thousand, two thousand, whatever it was, this little motorcycle around all these guys with, you know, j- you know, choppers and Harleys and all this stuff, just kind of saying it's okay not to fit in sometimes. Uh, Alan says, uh, "Collectible, yes. Gimmicky, no way." Yes, and Alan is right as well. I'm just saying what Pete told me. Pete is wrong about his own cigars, and it's okay. We forgive Pete. It's okay. All the respect uh, in the world for that. By the way, Pete was not happy with the Impossible Whopper today. So, are, are we going to get into like the whole boutique and stuff now? Is that where this conversation is? We could, yeah. Because we could be here. For what a while. makes a boutique? Oh boy. What makes a boutique? I was I was actually uh, texting with uh, Eric from Dojo about that today because on we won um, Cigar Wars or whatever it was, and they put that Alec Bradley was a corporate company, and I tried to correct them and they did they they did not agree. Okay, so I would say that Alec Bradley is not boutique. I would say that Alec and Bradley is boutique. So what, what makes I'm a, uh, I wouldn't say corporate though. I think I, I think I agree with you on that. I think I think I think that's an I think that's an unfair characterization or a mis or a misleading characterization because corporation to me is is kind of like general, altitus, uh even Davidoff to a certain extent. You know, Alec uh, Alec Bradley doesn't qualify as corporate. I would say that Alec Bradley doesn't necessarily qualify as boutique, but Alec and Bradley definitely does. So What's in between boutique and corporate then? Because that seems to be the only two. See, I think I think there's three lines of demarcation there. I think if there, I think there's boutique. I think there's non-boutique, and then I think if you wanted to go above to a a, a higher level, I think then that's corporate. But I don't think so, Alec Bradley qualifies as corporate. Let, let me give you my take on this because I have a different take. I got into a, I got I got into a debate with Jonathan Drew on this years ago over my definition of boutique. And I was putting in things about the size of the company, the production level. And Jonathan took a lot of exception when I said Drew Estate was not a boutique company, right? He feels that it comes down to the culture and the core competencies that make a company boutique. And he uses the words boutique is in the heart. 
I agree uh, with that. I agree with that, and that's why I would put – and he, he convinced me on it. That's why I'd put you guys, from what I've seen of your culture, and you're not a huge company. Yeah, I went in our office. You're bigger than, let's say, the one-man show uh, small company, but there's a culture in there. I'd say it's very boutique-ish in there. So I, I thoughts. That's kind of what well, I yeah. It, well, if I if, if if I may, I think I think culture is important from any company standpoint, and I, I think that it, I think that it does have to do with production level. And like I said, I think that there's there there's a there's there's a different line of demarcation in saying something is corporate. Again, I would not say that Alec Bradley is corporate. Um, far from it. But I think that there's yeah, a, I agree. It's not corporate. Different def, 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 a definitive characterization between boutique and non-boutique. I think it has to do with size. It has nothing to do with the production quality mm-hmm. or or the type of production that's being done or even the culture because the a comparison that just popped into my head of, and I'm not even sure about the, the numbers game of it, but like a, a, another kind of, you know, another kind of comparison is, is, is CL, you know, CLE, Christian Iroa. So CLE, I don't think is a boutique brand, but I think Asylum is. Mm-hmm. So I look at beer and, you know, the definition of craft or whatever it may be. You look at a company like potentially Dogfish Head, and I would call them a craft beer company 100%. They may have been bought by Sam Adams, whatever it may be, but the way they're producing their beer and everything behind it and their company culture and my in my opinion makes them craft and that's how i kind of view us as as well yeah but in in, if we're painting the same kind of line of comparison with beer like i think that that there's two distinct i think that there's three line three distinct lines in the cigar industry where there are two distinct lines in beer i don't think that there's like a i i I think there is there's craft and there's non-craft um, you know, Anweiser Bush, Sam Adams, um, to, to, you know, InBev is huge. So Budweiser, you know, yeah. you know, those, those types of just, they're, they're monsters, they're monstrosities, they're, they're, they're non-craft. And then they, but they're they also may, buying craft breweries. So, right, exactly. So, but I, I think that those companies, that. but much like, much like Alec and Bradley or even Lars Teton to that, to that effect. Those are craft companies under, excuse me, those are craft. Those are not, those are boutique companies under a non-boutique brand of Alec Bradley, but Alec Bradley is still not corporate. They're not, they're not in Bev. That's not, that's not, I think there are three distinct lines in the cigar industry where there are two distinct lines in beer. I don't think there's. We have the same initials as in Bev, but. <laughs> <not in-bev. laughs> right, exactly. So I, I think, um, you know, I think there's three distinct lines of characterization because, uh, as far as far as boutique, I think the, and I, I think where Jonathan and I don't want to put words in Jonathan Drew's mouth, but I think where Coop's discussion with Jonathan, um, where Jonathan may have taken exception to characterizing them as non-boutique, is that he he had he had built that company much like your father did from the ground up, and it was boutique when it first started. You know, it was smaller. They were doing lower production uh, lower production numbers and it, it, company culture he was able to take that company culture and, and build it, expand it. And that's to, that's to his credit for you. It's uh it's production numbers. Yes. For me, it's definitely, I I changed that whole opinion after, after he talked to me on that. And from someone who works in the corporate world and I've worked in corporate America for 30 years, I I could tell you, um, it, it, you guys are, you guys are, are boutique from that definite. If you take that definition of it now, I'm I'm not embarrassed. I'm not, saying your definition's wrong, but I kind of saw what he, the angle he was going. And, and, and Alan, by the way, agreed with JD's assessment on that too. Yes. So is, uh, is, um, Tatuaje boutique? No, definitely. Yes. So I was, I was talking to Pete about this as well at Cigar Fest and, you know, he's like, yeah, people have pushed me out of the category of boutique. And I was like, I don't, I don't get that. Um, I think a lot of people would agree that, and it may be different here that Illusion and Viaje are our boutique. Um, and I've heard that it's based on the blends and the packaging and the numbers and this and that. But a lot of Illusions and Viaje cigars are coming out of Rice Cubana. It's the same place that our cigars are coming out of. Um, 
And so someone may categorize them as boutique, but won't categorize us as boutique. Yeah, Rice. Um, is... But we're all making cigars from the same place from with tobacco. We're all using. That's a great point because Rice is a boutique. It would be considered a boutique factory. Sure. Yeah, and That's Alan fair. is he is emphatic on this. Your dad, he's a hundred percent boutique. Uh, I'm support. I'm supporting him on this. So like. You asked if Pete was like so. Tatawahe again. If you're finding my my line of my line of trade of thought is that Tatawahe is not boutique, but Latelier and surrogates are. Okay, I see, How they, I, I see your point. My my, I would say that my and I wouldn't even say that my father is corporate. Yeah, I, but they're definitely not boutique either. I see what you're saying. That I think my father is a different story. I don't think they're boutique. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I think the culture's changed. I think they grew into a bigger company. Is what happened. So yeah. I don't I don't know their numbers, but uh, AJ Fernandez as a brand are they boutique? No, as a brand, not as a fact. As the AJ the AJ Fernandez. So like San Latano, San Latano, yeah. Ramon, mm. yeah. Mm. That's a that's a really close one. That is, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a that's tough why one. I threw it out there. That's a hard question. That's a tough one. I think if you take AJ the Enterprise, you could say no. I mean, you could yeah. say he's he's a but you take AJ the brand, yeah. Yes. So this is the interesting stuff. But I'll say you're not corporate. I'll say you guys yeah. are definitely not a corporate. Yeah, no, company. Def- definitely not. Like I said, there's a there's a very distinct line of for me. There's we very need, we need to a third term. So so everyone call Eric after this. Tell him to change that not to corporate. Just say not corporate, even if it says corporate, just <laughs> not corporate. Not corporate, not boutique. Yeah. Let's all call Eric right after this. Yeah, we do. No, I, I, uh, like I said, I, like I said, I think you know that's just. Like I said, JD kind of changed my opinion on that a bit. You yeah. know, um, there's certainly, like I said, I think there's cultural things you you can apply there. Um, and certainly Drew Estate, maybe there's some changes now that they're part of a bigger corporation. Uh, they have some processes in place right now. I think they've tried when it comes to the cigar making piece to keep that that culture at least with the cigar making and, and switchers left them alone i think for the most part and let them kind of uh, be creative yeah which yeah. makes drew estate non-boutique and not corporate they're owned by a corporation but they're, they're owned not. by a corporate yeah yeah that that that's what makes it distinct for me so like yeah there isn't there really isn't that line of demarcation when you talk about with with altidus brands or general brands you know so like trinidad for example we were talking about earlier isn't boutique no they're they're corporate because they're part of the corporate structure yeah you know drew estate in his own entity is a is non boutique because of production numbers uh but they're not they're definitely not corporate because of you know if you want to throw in the the argument of culture so yeah. then what, um, was, what was room 101 when it was part of davidoff boutique i looked at it boutique because what i looked at it is matt had a brand he owned the brand he contracted with Davidoff for production and he used their distribution. But as far as the brand goes, it was still boutique. Yeah. I think I like Barry's definition because it goes a little bit more in depth. I, I, yeah. I like what he's I saying. Think so. on side. I like what he's saying, but yeah, it's uh, like I said, there's uh there's very few boutique companies under my definition though. Mm-hmm. Or the JD definition. Then you can make an argument like 80 to 90% of the companies, you could probably find six or seven companies that are not boutique. Yeah. So then what would the, uh, what would consumers consider? Con- what do you think consumers would consider it? You guys? I still think us, they, us, uh, I still don't, I think consumers don't think you guys are boutique, believe it or not. But I think yeah. it's, and I think there's a little bit of a stigma with that. That's not your fault. I mean, you guys, I think once I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Once, <laughs> yes, once you, you start getting a lot of press from aficionado, yeah, it's tough for that line for consumers. I, I, I said, folks of all the industry can see the difference, but I think from consumers they don't see the difference, and they 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 may still put you guys in as a big company. Yeah, yeah, I that's think, a, that's absolutely dead on accurate, Coop, from yeah. the consumer perspective. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Alec and Bradley and Lars teams are considered boutique, but Alec Bradley lies somewhere in the middle. Correct. Yeah. The, the way I see it, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think consumers also see it as like a availability as well. Like if you can find it in every single, in most stores, or you can find a lot of the stuff online, then maybe it's not boutique. But if you got to search a little bit harder for it, maybe it is boutique. Um, but yeah, I like Bear's definition. I'm gonna go with you. I think we could have drawn that out for an hour and a half if we really wanted. We 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 could have. Oh my gosh, we, we could. We'd be here for a while. 
Yep. The Got three it. lines of demarcation when it comes to boutique and the monster series is not a gimmick. Perfect. <laughs> All right. That's good. All right. Bear, anything else we want to hit? I'm good. All right. Hey, guys, I want, before we kind of wrap up, first, I want to thank you guys uh, for taking time. I know it was a long show. We did go three hours. Oh, um, so oh, I know. We do appreciate that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you guys hadn't, you guys hadn't over to enter to back at all. Uh, I'll be there. Nice. Uh, so safe travels there as well. Thank you. Um, quick programming note, uh, no show on Thursday. Um, Aaron's going to be at the Rocky mountain cigar festival. Uh, I'm heading up to New York tomorrow and then I'm going to be doing a weekend up in Rhode Island for a couple of days. So, uh, I'm going to be out of town for the rest of the week. So, uh, we won't have a show. Uh, we'll be back on uh, the 29th with primetime episode uh, 107 with Luis Cuevas. Um, and I guess I'll announce this right now. Uh, episode 108 will be Nick Perdomo. Yeah. Yep. That, that is conf- yep. So we have that as well. So, uh, so you want to stay tuned for that. That is just uh, hot off the presses there as well. Um, but guys, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I'll be, I'll hopefully I'll see you guys down in Florida at some point. So I'm going to be making a couple Great. more trips down there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, for having us as always and safe travels to New York tomorrow. Yeah. Bear Coop really appreciate it guys. Yeah. Appreciate yep. you guys. Yeah. Bear real quick. You got anything on Sunday, uh, coming up? Oh, absolutely. I've got, uh, I've got a boutique brand on Sunday. <laughs> I've got Mr. Dr. Bradley. Kurt. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, uh, I'd love to have you guys on the show. I have uh, Kurt Kendall of 724 Cigars. For yeah. yeah. There you go. And uh, Kurt's going to be on prime time in November. So, uh, yeah, Kurt, we say hi. Yeah. Well, yep. Great, great. Uh, yep. Great. Cigars. All right, guys. Thanks again. That's going to wrap up primetime special edition number 59 into the annals of history for Tuesday, August 20th. Now Wednesday, August 21st on the East Coast. Uh, We will see everybody a week from Thursday. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you next time. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you.